And I uh, put the uh, Xmas demo in into the uh, share drive too. All right. Well, we're going live. We're doing live in three. All right. Let's try this again. <laughs> Do it live in three, two. Hi, this is Dale Lear, designer of TRS-80 Color Baseball, and you're listening to Coco Talk. Coco Talk, the nation's leading live talk show featuring the Tandy Color Computer, with your host, Mr. Gameplay Goodness himself, Stevie Stroh. Episode 39, the Christmas Eve Eve edition. How is everybody doing today? Great. Great. All Good. right. Fantastic. Great. Nothing like awesome. some high energy music to kick off the Christmas Eve episode. And on the show today, well, let's just start with the uh, two, three most important people um, based on last night's live stream, anyways. <laughs> <laughs> but we have the winner of the Forest of Doom Chalice of Bravery concept contest, Mr. Jason Reigert, how are you, Jason? Welcome to the program. Hey, everybody, doing doing great, doing great. Uh, happy Festivus! I got my uh, undecorated metal pole. <laughs> <laughs> How's it feel to be a winner, Jason? Oh, it's <laughs> it's fun. I, I, I'm I'm enjoying it. I'll I'll get at least uh, I'll get at least two minutes out of this. Hey, fifteen minutes. <laughs> Everybody's entitled to their fifteen minutes. So. Uh... All right, and uh, also with us, also someone who has won uh, some Forest of Doom in his past. The first person to survive Forest of Doom was Ficecat, Paul Fice Fiscarelli. What are you doing there, Mr. Paul? And so Paul was part of our live marathon last night, and he also just happened to beat Forest of Doom again on difficulty level two. What's that, what's that level called, Bruce? Terrifying. The terrifying level. So he's posted a YouTube video of him playing all the way through on level two, terrifying level, where he actually beat it. So he's now the first person to beat Forest of Doom on level two. And he also has a very cool strategy for mapping your way out throughout the forest, which he shows off in that. I love the multiple camera angles there. So great job there, Paul, on doing that. On that same note, the author of Forest of Doom himself, Mr. Bruce Moore, all the way from Canada. How are you, Bruce? Doing well. Can you believe we were playing your bloody game for four hours last night? I, uh, you know, it was, it was a dream come true. You know, it's, it's, it's like we're all fifteen-year-olds and just don't yeah. know when to go to bed and I don't know. know when to stop, and it was awesome. <laughs> <laughs> yep. All right, and then go back around the room from uh, clockwise uh, position. Our Skype engineer, uh, host of uh, Newbie Talk, and just a fine, good-looking man there, Mr. Grant Leedy. How you doing today, Grant? Doing pretty good, and I just want to say that uh, the Force of Doom winner is fake news as a moon landing. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. I have I have video proof. Oh, we got witnesses. We got video. We've got things that will hold up in the court. They got while. video proof of the moon landing too. <laughs> That's so right. I don't know. <laughs> And we have returning with us. It's been a while, but from the UK, Richard Cavell. Welcome back to the program, Richard. How are you today? Hello, everyone. How are you doing? We're doing splendid. Pleasure to have you. And as always, it is an honor to have an A-list celebrity in our midst here. But Sir David Ladd, Lord of the Floppy, is with us. David, welcome to the show. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> We're also very fortunate to have Mr. Steve Bjork of Retro Computing Video Game Fame, Hardware Software Engineer Extraordinaire. Thank you for being here, Mr. Bjork. Oh, it's my pleasure. And today I'm in my green screen studio. <laughs> and also from the great white north all the way in O Canada, Curtis Boyle. How's it going, eh? Good. 
Okay. I was watching a bit of the stream on the Forest of Doom there, and uh, I noticed that if you defeat it on a higher level, watching Paul's video there, you actually get a different name from the king, a different rank. Right, right. What what other ranks? It is the uh, the Duke of Doom. There's uh, what else? Prince, I think. Paul yep. is now the prince. Yes. Prince there's of one Doom. to be obtained. One to be obtained. Yeah. So there's uh, there's different ways to win the game here. And we just lost somebody, but also with us the uh, creator of Timberman and the person who's helping me out on my project, which we'll see a little bit later today, Paul Thayer. How are you today, Paul? Hey, doing pretty good. Thanks. Just getting Merry, over a cold, though. Merry Christmas to you. Merry Christmas, everybody. I thought that uh, was Ron Delvo in the corner there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so so the big news story right out of the gate. So yeah, Forest of Doom, right? So last week we were hoping to reveal the winner, and we had not had a winner as of yet. We did a live stream where we were playing the game, and I was like, man, this game is a lot of fun. So we've all now kind of been on this mission. Let's play Forest of Doom. Let's try to win it. We did a live stream earlier in the week. We did not have a winner. I tried playing it a few times, did not win. And then last night, Friday night, we got together and um, it was pretty cool. So we had about six of us all playing at the same time, literally in different places of the world, right? So Bruce was in Canada, we had Brian in Australia, we had a couple of us in the States. So six grown men playing <laughs> a, uh, a game created by a 14 year old 35 years ago on a 35 year old computer for four hours <laughs> and feverishly trying to beat this game and dying over and over and again and just not giving up until uh, until we finally beat it and so yeah Jason the Coco Man is the next winner next survivor of Force of Doom great job Jason thanks and uh, I didn't die at all last night but I I got here late ah well, is that what it was so that was your first playthrough you played it once yeah. and you won yeah, it was about you know, it was about two hours forty minutes. Yeah, he didn't screw around. <laughs> he just went got straight wow. to business. Good That's job. Just, well, just trying he, to sh he, show the rest of us up. That's what he was doing. <laughs> <laughs> well, he just kept watching all the mistakes Stevie was making and just, <laughs> just do them, right? Right. <laughs> <laughs> that, was, that was my tutorial: what not to do in Forest of Doom. It's like most of your gameplay videos that way. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I'm an I'm an expert tester wow. for collision detection. So, <laughs> <laughs> and Simon Jonasson, the Madman from Denmark, has joined us. Hey, Merry Christmas, Simon. Hey, uh, Stevie. How do I get uh, How do I get all the people on the uh, on the um, <laughs> screen? Uh, click on my picture, the one with the green sidebar. You should be able to see everybody. Uh, I clicked it once. Um, nothing's happening. It, make it full screen, I think. Make make my camera full screen. I'm I'm actually doing it. Can you guys see me? I'm screen sharing. Can you see me? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's working. Yep. Uh, Look for the one that's got the kind of green sidebar. Click on that. And make that full screen. Okay, I will try. You, you might be seeing a picture of a Santa's elf that you don't think Steve, but that actually is him. Yeah, so. that's me. <laughs> yeah. Good. Who do we have in the live chat right now? In the live chat, we've got 13 people watching us right now. Um, so far, the people Norlander has said hi, and Solstice has to, said good morning. I actually morning. Had to click on Mark Overholzer. Okay, well I'm not sure. Yeah, whoever think. called you or you called, one of the two. Yeah, they well. called me. Okay. Well, yeah, welcome to the program, it, Simon. Hey, speaking of Mark, uh, we we uh, he just joined us there. Welcome I've to Mark. Been here. No, oh, well, been here. how'd we miss you? We did. Uh, oh, <laughs> I'm I'm un, I'm small and unnoticeable. <laughs> <laughs> He's an Apple guy, so we we tend to uh, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Talk about Apple guys. I got I got <laughs> punned by one of them today. Oh wow! The ones uh, one bit audio on the Apple two. Very cool. Uh, one bit audio. Yeah, I mean, you've yep. done some pretty thing. You've done some pretty impressive things with one bit audio, Simon. We've heard it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but they won at the Apple too as well. Yeah. <laughs> oh. Yeah, so. we don't want to hear about that here, though. Yeah, no, this, yeah, is, yeah. this is Coco <laughs> Talk. No, yeah. I have to, <laughs> this means I have to relearn sixty five oh two. Oh Christ! <laughs> oh, you poor. You might as well just bang your head against a wall and be done with it. Right? Yeah. Right. Just, I just, I, <laughs> no, I just, it's like 
got into the glory of the 6809 from the 6502 it's like now I have to re relearn 6502 oh my god what are you about right right I have to admit back in the day I literally worked with programmers that went crazy because they're programming on 6502 like I mean the guy had, was being chased by fireballs <laughs> uh, well, uh, seriously uh, seriously Steve um, 6502 yes you can do some wicked stuff but it's so coveted you wouldn't believe it it's got three registers right and they're all 8 yep. bit and they're all 8 bit yeah yep and anybody notice got, Paul's mug you've Paul's got two mug. Six, no, oh, Paul hold up your mug let's get a let's get a zoom in on this all right, so this is the first prize. It's got Let's the, see the it's, text. It says, "I was the first to survive the forest conquer, of doom." To conquer. Yeah, to conquer. Nice. I was the first to conquer the forest of doom. And there is only one of these mugs in existence. That's the Chalice of Victory. Was that one called, Bruce? I don't know. It was the one mug to rule them all. I think there you go. So, <laughs> Paul, so Paul has the honor of winning that first mug, and I think that's a great idea. Um, and and maybe we can ask Paul Thayer too. Um, Paul, have, now Paul, you are looking into possibly some merchandise now with uh, Timberman. Uh, kinda. I just was interested in making a T-shirt for myself. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah. I suppose I could. I didn't want to copy Bruce, you know. Hey, oh. do something and get this T-shirt, you know. So yeah, um, no. oh, well, Paul, you asked me about it. I did. I wanted to know what you thought, so I just basically took the flannel off the main character's shirt and yeah. put the face on it, and the and the. It looks pretty cool. Oh. Well, how about we're, how about here, here's my proposal, I, Paul? We, there, we could put it on Steve's swag shop if you guys yeah. want. Well, here here here's my proposal. You come okay. up. You come up with the contest of what you want somebody to achieve, and then Coco Talk will sponsor uh, buying the T-shirt for the winner. And okay. so it'll be a Coco Talk uh, Timberman promo. So you Man. figure out what you want the you fi figure out what the parameters are for winning the prize, and Coco Talk will pay for the T-shirt. Well, Whoa. you see, Glenn Taylor has practically unlocked every single character except for well, one. Free oh. seventy-five. Free seventy-five in one session. Three seventy-five in one session. Well, can I suggest yeah. a parameter then? Go ahead. That's Bruce. a good one, Simon. You, but yes, you only play on one-handed. Is it a only joystick? Play, yeah, it's one it's joystick. You have to play oh, with your non-dominant hand or something. <laughs> 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 you have to play with your left foot. Yeah. <coughs> oh, um, that's not a problem. I'll just choose the mouse. <laughs> <laughs> David has special talents, apparently. He, does. he only needs one hand. And I for think that. the prank prize is it should be a, a free link to the book for Forest of Doom. That should be the prize. There we <laughs> go. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'll think of one, Steve. I'll let you know. Yeah, no, yeah, I think it's cool. Um, yeah, so I've I, now that's the next game. Since we've kind of we we have almost exhausted our options in Forest of Doom, the next thing will be we should do a Timberman marathon, and we, now we need to challenge ourselves oh to see how God. far we can all get in Timberman. Um, yeah, I think so, it's kind of fun. It's kind of fun having these little pissing contests and having these bragging rights. And I think there's <laughs> I think you're onto something, Bruce. Between selling a physical book, which is a collectible, and then having a physical prize that you can actually win, um, you know, it's I mean. I mean, they, this was real competition. I mean, it was on. We're sitting here talking crap to each other, wishing death <laughs> upon each other. Grant's been wished death upon me more times than I know what to do. As soon as we went off the air, I'm calling Jason a son of a bitch for winning the game. So it's just like, you know, I mean, this, things were getting real. So <laughs> over a mug. <laughs> well, you know, those last, those last 10 minutes of gameplay when Jason had it, the scepter and was moving out of the forest got pretty tense. It did. It did. Pretty man. tense. It yeah. was like, it was like, man, you're on the edge of your seat, man. Pins and needles. Yeah. Um, Even Paul's second attempt, I mean, his last couple of screens here, he was getting attacked like every single move there, and he was beginning to wonder if he could make it. So, Oh, yeah. I was. Uh, if, you, if you watch the video, you can tell there's some frustration in my voice, genuine <laughs> frustration. I was, I was getting pissed. Um, it was, it was uh, I, I thought I was going to get killed again just two squares away from getting out of the forest. It was just that frustrating. Wow. Yeah. I I like what you did with the with the camera layout. You had the game, you had a you know had a face cam, and you had the um, the grid cam, yeah, map all cam. going the map cam all going at the same time. That was pretty cool how you set that up. Yeah, I was I was trying to come up with a way that I could basically show what I've been doing. Um, I kind of had a when I won it the first time, I did a 
kind of an ad hoc makeshift map. Um, I, I got stuck uh, the first couple times trying to get out of the forest, and I'm like, all right, I need to figure out what's going to be the quickest way out. So right. I had set up just a makeshift map, and then after I started playing a little bit more, I just decided to put this together. But I wanted some way that we could uh, that I could show exactly what I was doing as I was going through it. So I came up with that. Yeah, I'm going to show off that video uh, if I can <laughs> find it. Where the hell did it go now? Is, uh, should we be in the Forest of Doom chat room? Because you had just put that video down. Scroll back. <clears throat> yeah, there, there it is. There right it is right, right here. All right. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna sh kind of jump towards the end here, and just to s right now. So now, now the people who are live can see this too. So um, this is Paul's video, which I should probably copy and paste. There I'm gonna is. put Let's this in the this live chat shot. too. After erasing my map uh, twice now. <laughs> now I did notice you had some echo uh, once or twice. Terrifying kills. Um, but I think that echo um, went away after a while. Yeah, I didn't realize um, I had my desktop mic and my camera mic going at the same time. Cool. So I was picking it up from two different sources. Right. Well, what I like what you got going on here is you got the main game. So, I, so you did this in an emulator then, so you could capture that from the PC. Yep, that's exactly what I did. Right. And then you ha you created this little grid. <laughs> you actually created a damn paper grid. Forest of Doom mapping. Guide. Forest of Doom it. mapping guide. This is this should be something that should be sold on the website now too, right? So, uh, I actually I actually posted it on Discord earlier this morning, so <laughs> people can download it. Yeah. So I mean, sometimes the old school stuff's the best. It was. Oh, yeah. I mean, paper if you think pencil. if you think about it, you know, because this is based on Dungeons and Dragons, and what did we do in Dungeons and Dragons? We did it graph on paper. graph paper. You know what I mean? This yeah. is the graph paper. So. Uh, it doesn't get any more retro than that. So I'm going to try to find, I'm just going to kind of scrub through here. I should be able to find the thumbnail where you found the actual um, castle because we should see a big blue square in the top left hand corner, our blue blue sky. And we're scrubbing, we're scrubbing, we're scrubbing. Of course I lost my mouse position. Do you remember how, long, how, how many minutes towards the end before you found the castle? It was about an hour and 30 minutes in. Okay, about an hour and 30. Okay. Okay, this is showing the castle that way. Hour 29. And the thing about it, you, this was an hour and 45 minute session of you playing the game. There it is. You're okay, so this is, you, this is you finding the castle. Do you want to enter? Yes. Well, where's the music? <laughs> Just enough gold. And look at your grid here. I'll take it. You've been like all over the place here. Alright, so now you're leaving the castle. And where are you on the grid right now? But yeah, you know you want to go straight east. That's the quickest way out. It looks like. Five. As soon as you go to leave, five minotaurs attack you. All right. Yeah. And so. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah so those now, guys were pretty easy. I, I do run into a succession of uh, cyclops and uh, stone giants, which was not fun. All right. So now we're now we're almost towards the end. This is you about ready to leave the screen. You're fighting. Orcs. Ogres. Ogres. Ogres have layers. <laughs> All right. Jesus, oh, you can't catch a break with your footsteps. Three Cyclops. <laughs> bribe them. Just bribe them. You got like four steps to leave the forest, oh man. Gosh. You can't catch a break, huh? A dragon. Yeah, you got to give him more than 150 bucks there. <laughs> <laughs> 200. There you go. Oh, so they'll take 200 each. Nice. Yep. And you better yeah. leave. Yeah, we know where the castle is. We just came from it. Yeah, it's, it's better back be the edge way. of the forest. <laughs> Do you want to leave the forest? Yeah, Do you want to enter the forest, the forest again? Enter the forest again. No, we will not. There you go. Prince of Doom. There it is. All right, the terrifying. We finally made it. Oh. <laughs> That's pretty sweet. Pretty Whoa. sweet. Ooh. You like that? That's the infinity effect there. Yeah. And so, of course, we have the footage of um, of Jason winning last night. So uh, we have the full four-hour stream. We also have a recording. 
um, just of Jason's um, last few minutes of the victory too. But yeah, it's hard to believe that we are that we are doing that for four hours. And and I think Curtis and I talked about this a while ago because I was yep. struggling with the idea. How could we do an adventure game, like a text adventure game on YouTube? Because how can you make something like this interesting when it's just text? And I think the idea of having uh, 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 the crowdsourcing of everybody playing together and making it a party, I think that makes it interesting. You know, So I think we should try to tackle something like some of those other classic text adventures and just turn it into a, a live stream party. You know, mm -hmm. I think that might be fun. I, w cool. I wouldn't mind doing something else along that line too. Like if we did, say, Sands of Egypt, just have Steve guesting, and he can actually maybe give us some, you know, little stories about development. Like, you know, I designed this screen this way because of, and, and that kind of thing, just to give a bit of a history of the game while you're playing it too. We'd like director's commentary. Yeah, yeah. That's a neat idea. That's that would be a great idea. I have no idea if he'd be up to it. What do you think, Steve? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I just got to try and dig up the memories from 30 years ago. <laughs> hey, oh, looking at the screens might help uh, jog them a bit. So. Yeah. Jim Gary just joins us saying good day, good day, good day. All right, so let's take a quick uh, commercial break. But yeah, we are definitely um, we 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 are we are all high on Forest of Doom right now, and we're definitely high on Christmas Eve, and gonna be high on Cocoa Fest. So there's lots of highs right now in the world of retro and just in life in general. So uh, let's bring it down with a commercial, and we'll be right back. <laughs> Hi, I'm Randy Weaver, and you're watching Original Gamer Stevie Stroud. Greetings YouTubers, Atari Leaf here, and you're listening to Coco Talk. Hey, what's going on everybody? It's me, it's Original Gamer Stevie Stroh, and welcome to a brand new segment of the show that we call The Pandering Segment. And this is where we ask you to help support our efforts by checking out our retro swag shop at 8bit256.com, where you can grab yourself a coffee mug like this, or maybe like this, or maybe one of the even cool new deluxe travel mugs possibly even a DVD featuring some gameplay goodness. All of the proceeds that we get from the Retro Swag Shop go right back into the production and hosting costs of the show, as well as compensating the artist Joel Adams, who designs all these cool things for us. So consider supporting our endeavors by picking yourself up a piece of merchandise from 8bit256. Com. On top of that, if you'd really like to help out the show on a long-term basis, we've got a brand new Patreon site where you can support us with regular contributions. And you can visit us there at patreon.com slash OGSteviestrow. However, we'll keep it real simple. Visit us on the web at cocotalk.live and you can get all the information there. And while you're there, why not send us an email to cocotalk at cocotalk.live. We'd love to hear some feedback from you, some suggestions for future show ideas and topics, and maybe even submit a segment or bumper yourself. The show wouldn't be anything without you, and we appreciate all of your support. All right, and we're back. So, Paul, do you mind me showing off the sprite editor that uh, that you have uh, been so kind to share with me? Do it, buddy. All right, so we'll, we'll, we'll give you the quick backstory again. I think we talked about this a little bit last week, but I actually um, found a, a public domain video game I released. It was written in Quick Basic during the days of MS-DOS. I wrote it on my Tandy 1000. The game was called Cosmic Aliens. It was basically a Space Invader clone using the IBM character set, so the aliens were smiley faces and things like that. So not super graphical, but pretty quick and pretty fun uh, arcade gameplay. I found that game, ironically, which is a miracle in itself, because I don't have any of my old floppy disks. Uh, I found it, I did a YouTube video on it, and that's uh, inspired me to be my first software Coco project in, in, in well over 30 years. And so uh, the first thing that we ended up doing in order to kind of reach some of that, um, to, to kind of get back into this, was I, I wanted a quick and easy way to, to generate some graphics. And so I put out a couple messes, and this is what's great about um, the community is that basically I put out a message saying listen I was trying to use the draw statement I was trying to draw stuff and the pixels aren't lining up this is whack so um, who can help me out here and what we got was um, uh, basically Paul Thayer shared with me a kind of uh, custom version of a sprite editor I guess you had used something similar to this for um, Timberman um, yeah I this is like 
what I gave you is kind of like where I started in the current sprite editor that I have, all keyboard based. But uh, yeah, okay. Um, all right, so it's so, evolved a lot since then. Okay, but for what I need, since I'm going P mode one ultra low res, it was it was fine, right? So what you have right now is oh, is this is this the eight by eight grid or is this the sixteen? This is not the right one, is it? That's the eight by eight grid. We changed it. Oh, it just looks big. I'm confused. Okay, so you know what you have here, you know, is you can basically put pixels on here, right? So if I wanted to draw just a rectangle in the middle of the screen, I could do that. I could change colors, right? So that's color one. This would become color two. This would become color three, right? So if I wanted to go to yellow, I could do that. I could do a yellow block. So you can kind of see here. I'm just putting pixels in the grid. I'm just generating my sprite, and then I believe it was the semicolon. Uh, control semicolon or what the hell was it? Well, it's it's supposed to be control plus, like if you're control, using it okay, on a Coco yeah. three, right? But yeah. I'm doing it in Mame. So anyway, so then it puts the tile down there. So that's kind of what it looks like. And then was the control O for open? Yes, sir. All right. So let's try to get it open. And and then also the the beautiful thing about this is it lets me save these things out as bin files. So Cosmic Alien zero four was the last one, and these were the spaceships I redrew again this morning. And so here's all the sprites I came up with. So I've got my spaceship, I've got a couple different versions of, of an alien ship, a handful of alien ships, and then a handful of asteroids because I also have um, I had asteroid showers in my game. So I kind of drew these up this morning. I've saved them as a bin file, and I now am able to load these in and just use the color basic you know, get and put commands and um, and, 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 and make some graphics. And so I was able to throw together a very simple tech demo this morning based on the sprites that I created. So here's my program loading in the sprites. Here's, here you see me getting them and putting them. And now here I am on the screen with my joystick. And so right now what you have is the joystick is moving left and right. Here's my spaceship and I've got three aliens on the screen. I was hoping to maybe have up to eight aliens on the screen. Now the aliens aren't moving, but they are being re, um, you know, they're being redrawn on the screen each cycle. And this is the speed I'm. And now this is on the Coco Three high speed poke, so it's going to be considerably slower on a Coco Two. Um, but right now, this is kind of what I'm working with. Here's my spaceship. I can move my spaceship left and right. And here are so here are some of the aliens on the screen. The idea will be have these guys moving around, dropping bombs on me. I'll be able to shoot bombs on them. And here's my ship. So this was all thrown together in about an hour, and, and, and you know, so I had to spend probably at least an hour redrawing everything. Then I had to spend another hour doing all the math, figuring out where I had to get and put everything. And then I quickly threw together a routine to let me use my joystick and put some sprites on the screen. So um, this is what the game will hopefully look like, but you know, hopefully, I, I know it's already slow. Uh, on a Coco 2 without the high speed poke, it's chugging along, right? So, um, but it is what it is. It's in basic. Um, uh, it's probably going to prompt me to want to learn assembly faster than I wanted to. I had a, a plan, a plan, and an order to how I wanted to do things. But as I get all into this game and I realize that, uh, that the speed's going to suck, I'm probably going to be looking for ways to fix speed. Um, but yeah, so not bad. I actually really like this low res P mode one screen. I like the fat pixels. Um, I like not having a green background because everybody used the green background and no video game in the history of video games ever had a green background and it's just it's horrid so this <laughs> maybe golf yeah right so just having at least like a blue background looks a little bit spacey right you know um, and having these these kind of fat pixel bad guys I I think they look cool you know I think there's something very tray retro about this extremely blocky Figures and hopefully the low re low resolution will offer some speed. You know. Well, you know the graphics on here is very reminiscent of Apple style. You have to have square pixels, and mm. that's what you got. Yeah, yep. I like square pixels. So joystick left and right, um, and that's it. So the um, the guys are now. Here's what I, and again because my my whole frame of reference how I think and how I understand how a computer works is all based on the basic language uh, I know you assembly folks know that there's better ways to do things but um, if I could get and put a uh, in a, 
an actual arrays where I could get like you know get x1 get x2 get x3 I don't know if the get put does like these sub arrays for the oh. objects you're getting because if I if I could do that then I could actually do a for next loop and put all eight ships on at once so I have to have different statements for each ship that I want to do um, so uh, so I'm sure there's gonna be ways I can even optimize the basic code <laughs> right now that was a quick hack to get things on the screen uh, hopefully by next week I'll have animation and falling bombs and shooting lasers and things like that. So, you know, well, what you could do is instead of having like your get and put have like a an array to the um, name of whatever it is that you're getting, mm -hmm. is you could have something that points to the. Well, can oh wait, never mind. I'm thinking Coco three because you give it a number. Here you actually give it a variable letter, don't you? Yeah, so I have like yeah, a but you could still have one. like you could still have like s parentheses zero equals whatever your variable is for your your buffer that you want to grab, and just set that, and then have an x and y that's that same number mm. for that object. Yeah, I'll have to wrap my brain around those options. I do have arrays for the x and y coordinates of of up to eight on screen objects. Yep, but it's I wish I could have sprite. Yes, but I wish I could have arrays. For the for the get put objects and have those in arrays themselves, but they're not in arrays now. They're kind of like in variables. If I could get and put in arrays and make that match the x and y coordinates, I could have everything kind of synchronous with x y coordinate, bomb location, and array number. Um, that's probably more advanced than Basic was designed for, but it would help me tremendously right now. <laughs> Hopefully, by next week we would have you learned in assembler. <laughs> oh yeah, I'll, no. I just, I just, you know what? I got two weeks off. I'll just read the book front to back and poof, make all. No, nah, you don't need to read the book. <laughs> hey, you got some six zero nine experts here. Yeah, They're more than yeah. willing to help you with it. <laughs> you don't need to read the book. <laughs> we will convert you. <laughs> so I, guess I think once you get, I think once you get started with this, Stevie, you're going to realize it's uh, easier than you thought it was. It's challenging, yeah. but once yeah. you get started. Well, I'm almost thinking that the 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 challenge. So for me, basic is is almost it's 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 a warm pair of pants I've worn before. You know, I understand it. I can yeah, I can there. wrap I can wrap my brain around x and y coordinates. Uh, and I know in assembly we're not dealing necessarily with x and y coordinates because now we're dealing with screen locations and you have to offset by byte values and go down by 32. So it's it's like a new way of thinking. And it's not that I'm not. No, 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 Steve. No? You do everything as an X and Y. It's okay. your assembly language routines that convert it into the byte locations of the screen. Okay. All right. Yeah, you don't right. have to change anything. All right. Yeah. Okay. Let's say <laughs> that's my limited understanding of that. So, yeah. Well, you know, Steve, you could also just go basic O9. You get a speed boost that way. It still looks like basic. <laughs> yeah. Curtis, shut up. Yeah. yeah, yeah no. <laughs> Nick Marantes will like it. Yeah, nah. Yeah, nah, I, just, I, I suddenly feel like I need to take a shower. <laughs> I'm clean. I I'm feel, clean. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> and it's really too bad Microsoft didn't put integer variables into basic, though. That would have helped speed things up quite yes. a bit. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Well, Steve, I think getting the graphics down and, and being able to envision is helping motivate you, too. So we'll see what happens. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, I think it'll be cool. Um, the the challenge is coming up with the logic, coming up with the you know the gameplay, the engine, the loops, all that kind of stuff. Um, it was a lot easier in Quick Basic because I had a full screen editor. I didn't have to have line numbers. Uh, you know, the machine ran faster, and and I had more more options. So I, I'm actually you know rewriting a game on a system that's less capable than the system it was originally written for in in some respects. You know, so and it sounds like Base Nine again to me. <laughs> <laughs> Hold on. There's another option. There's Shower another time. option. What's that, bro? Well, a couple of us just last night were so, someone was looking up this uh, ML Basic, a basic compiler. Okay. And uh, looking around for uh, the manual for version two of it, and uh, and uh, so I, I fired that up and I got it going, and uh, um, yeah, it works. Yeah, there's some little tweaks you have to do. But it does have a couple of things in there which take advantage of uh, some some you know to speed th things up. It will run get and put statements. Okay. It, I don't know if that's going to run it much faster because it's going through the interpreter to use mm -hmm. the get and put. 
but there are some other things that will do more quickly. And yeah. uh, it had integer variables too, didn't it? Well, that's the biggest slowdown well, in basic because well, everything's well, floating points. This is what made me think, Curtis. Yeah, because I think uh, I think because it, it probably does the inter integer variable bit. Um, there could be a speed boost there, so it might be enough to to get your uh, you know your Coco two guys happy with. Uh, but again, it's there's a you know there's a little bit of a learning curve there, but it's not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And there's a couple of Coco three basic compilers too. I mean, the one you guys found, I think, was Wasacha Wears. That's right. And there's also Circomp has one um, C basic three or whatever the heck it was called. Yeah, yeah. I've tried that one with, and not had much luck. But I've actually got something to compile properly on ML basic, so I'm feeling a little happier about that one at the moment. Yeah, Computer had one too, but I think that might have been Coco one and two only. Okay, so Jim Gary's asking, when you're done, can I steal your code and use it on MCX <laughs> MC10? Yeah, uh, absolutely. Matter of fact, if my my whole idea behind this, if I'm gonna do a pro if I'm gonna do a new project, because I know a lot of people's projects right now, like for example, Forest of Doom, it was written on a Coco, it was finished on a Coco, so Dragon compatibility was is not part of the original design. If I'm designing something new right now, I do want to be conscientious of the Dragon. Um, which is why I also want it to be like a Coco 1-2 graphics mode. So the original game will be designed to run on a Coco 1-2 and Dragon, but I would like to be able to detect the Coco 3 and maybe enable pallets or enable high-speed poke and things like that. Um, so it will like kind of like um, what uh, uh, a bomb... Well, bomb threat had a had a deal where if you had a Coco three, you could use the RGB palette modes and things like that. You know, so um, did, did, yeah. didn't Farfall also have uh, detected both Dragon and Coco keyboards? Yes, I think it did. Yeah, yeah, it did. yeah, Mark. Uh, Solstice asked, uh, "How do you select the colors?" I think he's asking uh, about you just, the. Uh, you just press one, two, three, or four to change to the four colors on the keyboard. The numeric keys one, two, three, or four. How do you select the initial palette then? Palette set. Uh, well, the default set. palette set is set. I, I think Paul could tell me how. I didn't try changing the palette set. so it That's was, the oh, default okay. palette for Coco 1 or 2. Yeah. <laughs> On the gotcha. Color Computer 3, you can use the palette command to change them. But yeah, I think he's talking about the alternate color the set. Alternate you know, the alternate color set. Oh, you press F1. White. F1. Oh. I don't know if you have that enabled in your editor. Yeah, he does. Yeah, there was a, there was a way to change it. So. Okay. Well, that should, that should answer the colors yeah. the question. But yeah, and originally I was thinking about doing it in text graphics because that's what the original version was. But then I was looking at the Coco text fonts, and they basically all suck. So I'm like, you know, there's only so many letters that kind of maybe would look <coughs> like a spaceship, and it's just going to be a douche game. So, um, but <laughs> if yeah, I had, but you can edit it with <laughs> F Master. Oh wait, for you're talking about Co Coco Two. That's right. Yeah, for know. Coco Two stuff. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So, well, well, Steve, when you're ready to start oh. throwing a little assembly language in, we'll do it step by step. We'll do like the graphic routines, and you just do a user call to run those things. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So Hi you don't have hybrid to go all program. In. Yep, hybrid program. Yeah, like I was gonna. Track. I was actually gonna write like his VSync one, and because I don't really understand the user call like the the from basic, but I do use execute points kind of is how I did it, but. Yeah, I was yeah, going to clear a some. Uh, use the clear command to reserve some memory at the top, and you use the exact different subroutines that you've set up, and then you can poke in like valleys if you need to put. Like, I want to put the ship of you know the X Y. You poke the X here, you poke right. the Y here, then you exec whatever. Yeah. Cool. All right. Well, that's that's Not an like offline you got a lot discussion. Of people to help you. <laughs> yeah. No. No. And that's good. And that's good. And and maybe for the sake of saving time. Uh, you know that might be the way to go, but my whole thing too was I also I kind of wanted to go through the struggle and learn it on my own right. and, and get there. But maybe mm -hmm. because it's a project, you know, we'll take some shortcuts to get the project moving. Because um, I would like to show something off at of Coco Fest, and yeah. I, I would like it to be on a ROM cartridge ultimately when it becomes a. Sound. I figured I would do it like I'd do it in Basic first and finish it. Okay, here it is in Basic, and yeah, it's done. And it's slow and it sucks. So now phase two is we'll start to introduce assembly routines to speed it up. Phase three, learn assembly, write it in all assembly, um, and kind of do you know, multiple versions of the of the program. But obviously the timeline to do that is going to be longer too. So I'm throwing throwing in the compiled version using that compiler they found here if it's quite compatible, but which it is by the sounds of it. That'd be nice to show. You know, this is the speed up you can expect from a compiler that's available, and then mm. once you get into the pure assembly, you can go, and this is what you can do when you actually recode it. Yeah, yeah. So, I think it's a good idea to do what you want to do, Steve. Basic first, and then slow into assembly. 
Yeah, yeah. but yeah. but by the same token, I, I I'm already feeling the crunch of basic, and I'm already feeling that it's just not going to give me the the frame rate I need for it to be a playable game. So we'll we'll cross that bridge. One um, thing, Dave. One thing. I was know. just going to say to Paul. Uh, would you be up for maybe modifying the output so it's a little bit more friendly for an assembly assembly language routine? Oh yeah, definitely. I could do that. We we got kinda, time. Yeah. <laughs> what I was trying to say was um, Stevie, Paul, um, Steve, um, whatever you choose to do, uh, just ask questions. Just yeah. ask questions to yeah. anyone and everyone. You know, yeah. just ask questions to everyone and anyone because we're all here to help you. Well, that's what he's yeah. been doing. You yeah. put a call yeah. out for the editor, you got it. Yeah, yeah, that's a good. That's a good example of that. Yeah. At the end of the day, at the end of, the day, just keep asking questions because people will are and will help you. Yeah. No. Yeah. no that's, Unless you uh, ask an Apple II question, then you're on your own. <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah. Of course, well, that. you will get the answer no. that it's square pixels. <laughs> yeah. And really blocky. Yep. I like and the, the basics. No better. All right. Very cool. Nice little opening story there. Uh, we have uh, Force of Dune to be excited about. Uh, did, did anybody, does it, besides my little project, did anybody work on a project this week, or did anybody maybe pick up something cool, uh, some soldering things, some circuits, some resistors, capacitors, eBay, anything like that? Yeah, I took apart a Coco Three. Ah. <laughs> and what that did you I find? Thought it was a PAL. Ah. But it wasn't a <coughs> hybrid. Hybrid. It was actually an NTSC Coco 3 with a uh, funny transformer stuffed in it, so it will work on 220 volt instead of 110. Okay. But it still outputted NTSC signals on the CMP and the whatever. So I, I, right now I'm fighting soldering an RGB cable for it. To be able to show what I'm trying to do in real hardware. Okay. So cool. it's it's basically a bit of a bastard. <laughs> <laughs> Nick has one. <laughs> That's cool. Good times. Good times. Oh yeah, I was gonna ask. I I asked Simon this, and we didn't really know. So like Brian Joyce, he's from Australia, mm -hmm. ordered Timberman, and I sent it to him. I don't have to do any. Do I have to do anything different with the program for like his for his monitors down there or his TV possibly? If if you're programming the gimme specifically, uh, the gimme register that controls the hertz frequency, sixty or fifty. If you're actually forcing setting it to sixty, you will have to patch that unless he's you know running an NTSC style one. I gotta remember if I do or not. Well, or if you leave it alone from whatever basic boots it up to, then you'll be okay. But if you're overwriting it. Then you might have to change that. Yeah, I'm pretty sure we changed some stuff in that address. Yes, so we did. We'll we'll probably have difficulty with that, but that's all right. Oh, that's not a problem. That's just one bit change. Yeah. So. Yeah. All right. Well, cool. Thanks. Thanks, Curtis. I got a little hardware project that I got in. Okay. Got a uh, SCART to HDMI adapter. Nice. Got my SCART cable. Okay. And thanks to Dave and others. In the Coco community, we now know how to properly make a uh, RGB Coco to SCART and have it work correctly. <laughs> so I picked up a cable that was a dual uh, cable. I'll just cut it in half, use one for a Coco, and another one's going to be hooking up one of my arcade machines to an HDMI adapter. Ah, oh, neat. Nice. Neat. Yeah. yeah I've got I've got to send my cable back to um, Richard. I didn't get a chance to do that yesterday. Now it's, it's going to have to be after Christmas. I'm not going to try to hit the post office until after Christmas at this point. Um, is that, oh, is, oh uh, why not? Uh, <laughs> what was that, uh, Simon? Steve York, is that a full SCART cable? Is, is the SCART cable fully connected, every single pin? Yes, it is. Yeah. Those are hard to come by. Yeah, it's uh, all the lines are shielded. Yeah, no, those are very hard to come by. Yeah, you also pay a little bit more, but it's worth it. 
Mm. Neat. Definitely. Very cool. Anybody else got a project update or anything cool you came across this week? I finally got my copy of Timberman. Hey. Yeah. Been enjoying that. <laughs> yeah. I've now, had it to enjoy, but now I have now I have the physical the physical copy in the in the book and everything right, here to enjoy. Right. Yeah. It doesn't look like you even opened it yet. Oh no, I've opened it. The the, the, <laughs> the little the little sticker is not on the on the uh, the open side. It's just kind of on the end there. Hmm. No, I've been in there. I've got the card out of there. Did you play it yet? Oh yeah, yeah, I played it. How far did you get? Not that far yet. <laughs> <laughs> I've been caught up in this whole Forest of Doom thing. Yeah, yeah right. That's a hard uh, game. I discovered something. Uh, I'm trying to get my camera back on without little success here, it looks like, but uh, Bruce Moore here. Um, I discovered a uh, previously unreleased uh, text adventure game I wrote. Oh, yeah? Like, it's it's complete, and... It looked. I mean, I I'm, I got to have to sit down and play it now, and just to make sure that that is indeed true. But uh, I think I found another piece of very like. It would still. It would be Forest of Doom, sort of, around that time, probably. And uh, wow. I I forgot about it, so I never released it or anything. So I'll take a look at it and see if uh, see if it's worth releasing. <laughs> <Basically. Okay. laughs> Sounds like some yeah. new old stock. Yeah. 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 Sorta. Yeah. Yeah. And that'd be cool to uh, to look forward to. Yeah. What, what's this, Stevie? Is this the thing you just bought? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what I ended up doing was I saw this on eBay, and I'm like, all right, I don't need another Coco Two. I need one like I need a hole in the head. But the the price was like I ended up getting it for for thirty five dollars, right? And so it is a sixty four K Coco Two in the box. And so then, and it's it's one of the newer ones or a newer style box, anyways. Now the picture shows a chiclet keyboard, I don't, and, and this, but this actually has a uh, the 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 better keyboard or the melty. Yeah, the picture shows the melty keyboard, but um, it's got the slightly better, you know, Coco Three style keyboard. Um, this happens to be, I think, the Model B one, which has the lowercase VDG, and it came with a little manual here. So, you know, a Coco 2 in the box for $35, it's kind of like, it's a sin not to buy it. Um, <laughs> it's kind of how I look at it. Spoken so, like a true addict. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so 64K Color Computer 2, Model 26-3127B, right? The, the Bravo model is the one that had the uh, the, the lowercase VDG, right? Should, yeah. Mm-hmm. You, so. you no, know, not not 100% guaranteed. Okay. There are two Model Bs, one <clears throat> with and one without. So okay. it's not a guarantee that it's the um, 6847T okay. one. Yeah, and I didn't buy it for lowercase, but I just thought that was kind of cool. I really bought it because it was a Coco 2 in the box, and it was $35. So, and know, it has a cassette I, cable. I, yeah, I, I felt obligated. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's got that RF switch box, too, I see. Yeah, yeah, those mm -hmm. that's that's a rare and vintage RF switch box, so I can just <laughs> f put that back on eBay and flip it for 100 bucks easy. So mm -hmm. <laughs> That works with a shark with cable, book. too, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. It works with a shark cable, for sure. So, uh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> uh, very cool stuff. Very cool stuff. So, yeah, I look forward to having that come in and, and, and plugging that into my rack. I started setting up a new um, Tower of Tandy over here. And I realized on that second shelf that when I had the full size Coco One, it was oh, it was like kind of hanging over the shelf. So I think a Coco Two would be nicer to have on that shelf there. Um, it's kind of like mostly for display, but also kind of hooked up. All right. So what is Solstice saying? It's a sin not to, but uh, buy it. Agreed. I got a 64K Coco Two through Craigslist for forty dollars. No box, nothing, just a Coco. But still, yeah, forty dollar Coco Two is uh, it's a good deal. <laughs> Retro innovations. Our, our our troll has made it to the chat. <laughs> Coco hoarders coming to a YouTube near you, right? <laughs> it's not hoarding if you know where everything is, right? So, <laughs> all right. Well, let's uh, let's take a quick commercial break, and then we will. Uh, by the way, Grant, do you have a newbie question today? Yes, I do actually. All right, you want to do the newbie question after the commercial break? Sure. And then we'll get into some news around the world, or at least around Facebook. 
All right. Well, we'll be back in two and two, people. Hello, I'm Richard Chrislip, and I'm coming to you via the Original Gamer Stevie Stroh's program. Hi, I'm Mike Rowan, and you're watching the Original Gamer Stevie Stroh. And when you're done watching, come over and listen to the Coco Crew Podcast. What's going on, everybody? The Original Gamer Stevie Stroh here, and I want to talk to you about Amacoconut.com. If you love the color computer like I love the color computer, then you got to visit Amacoconut.com, your one-stop shop for all of your Tandy Color Computer Links needs. There you'll find links to blogs and podcasts and project sites and emulators and downloads and groups and communities. If you love the color computer, head on over to Amacoconut.com. That's I-M-A, Coconut.com. Tell them the Original Gamer Stevie Stroh sent you. Coco forever, people. That's right. Tell them I sent you to the website for free access to that free website. <laughs> <laughs> Act now. Hey, yes, how much I have to pay Alan to be in all those photos? Yeah, right? <laughs> 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 Operators are standing by. So, yeah. <laughs> IMA, coconut.com. So, we're going to introduce Grant Leedy here in, um, in newbie talk here, but i got to find my little intro here. So, we're, here we go. Professional show here, people. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, are you ready for newbie talk with your man and my man, Mr. Grant Leedy, with the newbie question of the week? Take it away, Grant. All right. Well, I have a uh, pretty <laughs> easy question, mainly for Steve, because now that he's making a uh, game, I want to know what is your process to starting to develop for a program slash game. What's your planning? What, how do you start out? All right. Well, the first process was just creating the graphics, right? And that process was streamlined by having um, Paul's editor, right? So I have these little graphics. Um, I'm using the extended color basic commands called get and put, which lets you, ba it's kind of like copy and paste, right? So you're just like cra capturing a piece of the screen. So now that I have quote unquote gotten all of these different pictures, I can now put them on the screen, um, you know, and make them look like a sprite on the screen. So that's the basic approach. So now the question is, well, now we have to start setting up our variables where, where is my, where is my spaceship that I'm staring? Where are the X and Y coordinates for all the enemies? Um, how do I put them on the screen? And then um, most of my programming of all the games I've ever done in, in the past have all relied on the computer's built-in ability to generate random numbers. And so um, a more advanced way to do it is to have algorithms and AI and a bunch of stuff like that. But I've always just relied on the computer to generate a random number. So cosmic aliens, the, the aliens will move in different patterns. and But if they go left or right or up or down, it's just a random decision. So um, it's easier to program program using random generation but you don't have as much control and you can have some unexpected results right so uh, one of the things I'm gonna have to toy around with with this one is am I gonna keep them random or will I create a pattern or algorithm for the for the ships to move you know um, and so you know you have to keep in your head the you know the X and Y coordinates of where everything is you've also got to come up with a ability to determine has my laser beam hit that ship and in and, and in the past I've used commands to just look for the color of a pixel you know usually the screen is blank and if there's a non blank color then yes I've touched something and there's your collision detection that's a real simple way to tell if you've hit something but this this is a little bit more complex so I'm actually gonna have to compare the XY coordinates of my missile versus the XY coordinates of all the spaceships and are we in the same spot and if we are then there's a hit so you know I'm kinda of thinking out loud what you know <clears throat> what the game logic is gonna be like so a lot of that has to go in and you've got the kind of main game loop that just animates everything and lets you move back and forth and just keeps the cycle going you've got to add up your score as you hit things when you hit them then you've got to make like an explosion look and then subtract one from the total number of aliens on the screen and you know there's a lot of stuff in there and, and and for me to like have to rethink through that process now it's it's taking me longer like when, I don't know why when I was younger I could do it a lot quicker and it almost mm -hmm. seemed like a natural thought process of just thinking how to I, when you used a computer every day you thought more like a computer it seems like you know I was a lo lot more logical minded when I was 14 than I am now I've had a lot I've had many years to be dumbed down by the analog world so um. <laughs> <laughs> okay. so. So, so, Grant, I think the simple answer that Steve is trying to say is that he's winging it. 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, I yeah, do have I do much standard process. Yeah. I, I, I mean, I, it's like I know in my head what I want to do, but exactly what are the steps going to be and how, what, how do I actually write that in basic and how do I tweak it? You know, that's, that's all. Even when you know what you want to do, there's a lot of trial and error involved to get it just right, you know. Plus, there's a lot of ways to skin a cat, so you might try a couple ways and, you know, they work, but they're not quite efficient enough or fast enough and you might yeah. change your mind after, so. One thing that I might suggest for your uh, collision detection, Steve, uh -huh. since you're doing this in basic and you were talking about comparing X and Y values with your missile and your object, mm -hmm. um, is to set up like a basically just your grid and move your objects in and out of that grid and test the grid as opposed to uh, ah, variables. Okay. It'll be so, faster. So, so the, all the screen positions are in an array, and if two objects are in the same position, then collision has occurred. Yeah, that's a faster way to do that same thing in basic. And yeah. yeah, pixel detection doesn't always work very well in shooting games like that. So. Right, right. Yeah. And, and, and when I've got multiple colors, too, you can't say, well, I can't look for a single color now because, it, you know, um, so that's, yeah. So going into this, I know my collision detection routine is going to be more sophisticated than anything I've done in the past. Uh, but I like yeah. that idea where you, you basically break the entire screen into a grid you have that tracked and you know what's in what part of the grid and if two things are in the same spot then collision collision yep yeah um, that'll help too if you add star fields and stuff too because if you do the point detection you might trigger on something you're not supposed to actually shoot yeah, yeah. well if you what can imagine like in Zaxxon you can't do screen collision it's a three-dimensional environment yeah and all the games that I've done have basically been uh, object collision you have a point that, that you're always referencing that's the center of your object and you also have a size how big that object is and you're checking against two objects to see are they hitting each other based on their center point and the size from the center point hmm. and uh, that's one of the things I wanted to talk to you Paul, Paul in regards to your graphics editor I'd love to put on there two marks that you could sit there and say this is the center of my graphic character so when I'm drawing it this should be my you know my main point they'll be the center okay interesting yep. yeah yeah imagine that you had the same challenge with kind of uh, it's you know you've got that orthogonal coordinate system and you have to kind of do it in 3d exactly yeah just um, yeah, for me, doing the isotomic view was not a problem because I had always done object-to-object -object collision in the math, not in the graphics. Mm. Right, yeah. Using the map as opposed to the graphics is the best way to go. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I mean, especially on, like, retro systems where you're, I mean, you have a, a limited amount of cycles, you know. Uh, now, um, precise collision detection isn't a big deal because, you know, you got a million cycles a second or whatever it, mm -hmm. it's, it ends up being so but yeah grid base is, is a good way to go for sure in almost well, every instance part of that collision that you're doing is you're having to calculate the hypotenuse of a triangle we all know that doing a square root takes a lot of time but did yeah. you know that you can be within 90 percent of accuracy if uh, you're looking at your right your triangle and you take the, the X and the Y of the triangle, the shorter length, divide that by two, add it to the longer length, you'll be within 90 percent of what the uh, square root type of calculation of the hypotenuse would do. Interesting. Makes a re and dividing by two in assembly language... It's just a shift. It's, it's a, a shift. shift. Yep. Exactly. So mm -hmm. I can calculate that collision about <laughs> as fast using that technique. Close enough. Close enough yeah. for hand grenades. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, uh, Timberman was had a particularly easy collision detection because my tree branches were basically one eight bit uh, value, and the one the one represented a branch, and a zero would be a blank spot on the tree. And so every time that we would cycle through, and you would chop a branch off, it move it would shift everything to the right. And it would fall off, and then that, so I'd grab the carry, and I would put it into another variable, and then it would detect based on if it was bit one or bit two, and if you were on the left or the right, you were hit. So it was pretty, it was pretty simple in that, like no complicated, 
uh, math equations or anything like that to do that. It was pretty. It was nice. And actually, the uh, right. single very uh, single value uh, for the tree was Simon's idea. And yeah, I was all like, oh, I need uh, I need to have an array of eight numbers. And he's like, Nope, you can do it in one. And I was like, What do you mean? And we <laughs> went on for probably a good forty five minutes arguing. And finally, he convinced me. So mm -hmm. don't argue with the madman. <laughs> nah, you usually don't want to, but right. every once in a while you can give him his own awakening. Right. Not, I think that's Sockmaster's job. Right. <laughs> right. It is definitely. We we we're all open to we all open to suggestion. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, yeah. I have a question about collision detection that maybe somebody knows, like perhaps Curtis. Um, I was playing uh, Crystal City earlier today. And I hate that game because it always screws me over. <laughs> but uh, I was wondering how he did the collision detection in that game. I th I'm thinking it's color based, but does anybody know specifically what he did? Uh, I don't know. I've never really talked to Jeremy about that. I know he used compiled sprites throughout it, but yeah, I know. But he's just got so many objects everywhere, and the and the ground is like one big piece that I'm assuming he's like. Um, Depacking on the fly and like drawing like a, a a single byte strip at the end and scrolling it in, but <laughs> yeah, I was just curious how he was doing his collision detection there because that game is so fast, it'd have to be something really minute, you know what I mean? Like two or four cycles to figure it out or something. So yeah, I don't know. I'd have to ask Jeremy, and I haven't talked to him in years. Yeah. I wonder if he talked asked. about it in that uh, book that Nick made with him. Because uh, didn't he, he interview he, him in that book? Yeah, he, he did. He he talked about the compiled sprites and stuff, but I don't think he mentioned anything about the collision detection. Ah, uh, dang. I have the book. I could dig it out and take a look during the next commercial break, but I don't think he mentioned it. Maybe I should just disassemble that program. I wonder what that <laughs> looks like. I wonder what that looks like. <laughs> Probably lots of self-modifying code, for one. Right. Well, getting back to your question, Grant, you've heard a lot of yes. people talk about a lot of things. Has <laughs> any of that helped with your question? Yeah, and I have one more question for uh, Bruce. How did? What was your process when you uh, did the um, um, text adventure? I'm going to say text adventure, but your but your game, your RPG. Doom. Yeah, Force of Doom. Oh well, you really don't want to model my process because I was <laughs> learning to code. Um, in, in fact, uh, you know, early in the code, I'm I, like I just started making stuff, and if I look in there at the earliest code, I go like, what What the heck did I do that for? When I could have done it so more simply, like, and so I can actually see the progression of my learning. So there's a lot of trial and error there, and and really in this, so so this isn't a good model, but but basically, when it, when it came to getting it ready to distribute to you know for real time playing. There were certain pieces of that legacy code which I, I just I had to leave it alone. I had to not touch it, or else if I tried to fix it, it blew up. <laughs> so I had to work around it. <laughs> so, so there are a couple of funny there are a couple of funny little things that happened in the game that are just like you know yeah you know I wish I could have changed that but no. <laughs> so so for Forest of Doom, it's just like just start slinging code and if it sticks, you keep it. <laughs> that was all that happened initially. <laughs> I will say, because I've been disassembling Rogue and trying to shrink it down a bit so I can add some options to it here, I think the people that wrote that for Epics were learning the 6 and the 9 as it went along, or at least had a couple of different programmers with different levels of skill. Because you can see chunks of the code that are doing things as if it was a 6502, like, you know, I need a 16-bit value, load two separate 8-bit registers, mm -hmm. and, and do all kinds of silly things like that. And there's other parts where oh, you can yeah, see that yeah. they're starting to learn things properly, uh, like stack usage with multiple registers and stuff. So it's the exact same thing, where they were learning as they go, and, and they got better as they went. So you can kind of tell what routines were done first and which ones were done later. Uh, what, what, what we couldn't do if we took one of those games apart... And made it pure sixty eight oh nine. Right. If we took one of those games apart where you've got a programmer from like sixty five oh two world that's using eight bit registers and pointers and stuff like that and really turned it around, how fast would it be? Yeah, well that's what I've been doing with Rescue and Fractalist, because he did that in a really quick Version there, and I've been going through. Like he did a lot of extended addressing and 16-bit indexed uh, uh, indexed offset addressing, which is slow. And he, yeah. if he had set up the variables differently, he could have made it so much faster. And that's what I've been doing. Rescue so far, I've got about a 10 
yeah, because speed increase. It's all about it's all about thinking, isn't it? It's all about okay, this works, but does it work? Hey Simon. Yeah. Simon, have you have you heard last month's uh, Coco Crew? Uh, um, not offhand, no. Okay, the interview part's really good. The uh, guy I was trying to remember his name. Uh, <laughs> Moriarty. Uh, Moriarty, right. Yeah, Brian. Ryan Sherlock Moriarty. Holmes right. name, yeah. Right. He was talking about how he liked the 6809 because with the 16-bit registers, the size of the uh, the interpretive engine for the Infocom was smaller. He said the typical size for an 8-bit machine was like 8K, whereas it was like 5K with the 6809. Yeah, tell me about it. Yeah, he was blown away by that. He was so excited. Yeah. He, he's like, you wouldn't believe this. The 6809 <laughs> was like an 8-bit version of the 68,000. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, we can get that's 2K. Yeah. So, well, back yeah. in the days when I was programming on the 6809, it was more of what is the best way to do something. There was like six or seven ways to manipulate information in and out of the CPU. It was just trying to figure out which one was the best for your needs at the time. But yeah, there are so many options and ways to load up an address into the X registers. Like, okay, do I do this one, that one, this one? Yeah. And well, is it, it an indirect one or something? Like, is that faster in this particular case? And mm -hmm. yeah, I, do I do a load effective address? Do I do a straight load? Do I, you know, and oh yeah, I t I tell you what, um, Steve, um, Steve Bjork, yes, really yes, because there are so <laughs> many ways to pull off what you want to do, and mm -hmm. you you need to really think about okay, what do I want to achieve? Why do I want to achieve it? Um, to make the fastest possible code, and uh, that's what I really love about the 6809. Go on, please. Yeah, it's just you have options, and most other processors you don't. And the 6502, you really don't have options to do much, so you have to kind of do self-modifying code and other things that are considered bad programming uh, techniques. Period. Well, a bad programming techniques. Let's, let's 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 just go there for now. Bad programming techniques. Um, if you're doing, let's say, audio on the 6809, and you're doing like two voice audio, uh, would you call self modifying a frequency register um, a bad technique? Well, when you do self modifying code. The code cannot be re-enterable. In other words, it cannot be shared, cannot be re-entered while it's being used. That's one of the techniques. That's why you don't do self-modifying code. I, 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 I totally hear what you're saying. I totally hear what you're saying because if you're doing wrong, if you're doing something that needs to be OS9, then, then you're stuffed, right? Yeah. But if you want to do fast, yeah. yeah, it depends. Yeah. It depends on your goal. I mean, I, I, another thing too is, I mean, if you take a look at some of Steve's older games and stuff, I mean, you, you could, if you spent some more time, you know, optimize them to be faster, etc. But at that time, the goal was to get it out on time, and not, not, not to make it the absolute you know, most pristine code you could possibly do. So it depends on what your yeah. goals were. Yeah, and the other thing too is, unlike today, you can't send an update out. <laughs> right. Uh, yeah. It once. Yeah. Once it went into a ROM burns. pack, it went into a ROM pack. It stayed there. They could be selling that ROM pack for two years. It's going to stay the same ROM, even yeah. if they know there was bugs in it. Totally, so it had to work I, properly. I totally hear what you're saying. I totally hear what you're saying. You know? Yeah, and uh, Rick just hit that with bomb thread, actually. Right. Yep. Matt. Today, yep. today we have the liberty. Today we have the liberty of cross assembly. We have the liberty of um, making it as best as possible because we don't have any time pressure. We don't have today. It's a hobby. I don't know where you live, but I have time pressure enough. <laughs> I'm working on my projects. Well, and I have a question. And, and I think it means as a hobbyist because if you're if you're writing a game yourself, you're not. It's not like you're promising I'm going to get it out for Christmas. You know, it, if it's a Coco game, it's just like I'll get it out when I get it done. So I mean, you have some time to optimize. You can optimize more for speed. Um, yeah. you, can, you can fiddle around with self-modifying code if that ends up being better. And I know exactly the routine you're talking about because Nick uses it too. That's um, what. That's that's exactly why I meant, Curtis. 
Yeah. Well, I wanted to know why is it considered bad to do self-modifying code? Because, I mean, we used it all over the place because it seemed to be the best option, especially when you're going for speed, right? There's, there's so a I, couple I just want to know why why it's considered bad or uh, a taboo to, to do that. Yeah, there's a couple reasons. I mean, one, it's harder to debug because if your code's modifying itself and that's causing the bug, that's hard to track. Okay. Yeah. I mean, on a simple sound routine, probably not so much. But if you're doing a lot of it, that that gets the, um, you know hard to manage. If you want re-entering code, like Steve was mentioning before, which OS nine pretty well likes too, you, then that's also bad too because now you're modifying it uh, on the fly too. And if it's a shared program that I'm trying to run another window and it should be in the state that that window wants it to be in, but I've already modified it to something else, then I've screwed up the second copy. When um, I was developing my games, I was developing the games as if they're object-oriented code. That's another place you do not do self-modifying code because once you've created an object and you're going to use it, it's considered a black box. You don't know what's going on inside of it, and you could have something that causes a problem. Hmm. Yeah. Now, on okay. the other hand, OS 9, you can legally do self-modifying code if you copy the routine into your data area because you get a unique one for each copy of the program. The program itself has to stay static, but you can make subroutines that actually self-modify. So you can kind of get around it a little bit too. The other one is even on modern computers, that's it's more of a challenge too is self-modifying code because now you got caches and stuff thrown in. So all of a sudden, I made a dirty cache because I've just modified the code, you know, in the cache. Mm -hmm. That's problem. Where's who's that rumbling coming yeah, from? Yeah, who's on? Who's on the? Uh, who's on the pirate ship right now? It sounds like somebody's <laughs> on the ship, and I hear things <laughs> creaking going on there. Walking the plank. Yeah. I guess I can understand that from the perspective of doing games or programming period back in the 80s and using Edtasm. I mean, when we were developing Timberman, I, I guess I had the liberty of being able to test my code as I went, and that was a lot harder to do back then. So, Yeah, it depends on the purpose. I mean, self-modifying code is good if you need to streamline a specific routine. And a sound routine where you're mixing voices together is a perfect example. It's not a lot of code. It's not too hard to debug because it's a very small routine that's just adding however many voices together and then shifting them back to fit the, the, the bit range of your actual sound output device. So I, I personally, I would use it on something like that. And if I was going to do it in OS 9, I would just copy it into the, the data area and run it from there. But if you're doing like the whole program, if you're self-modifying code all over the place, doing your graphics, doing your sound, doing your AI, doing everything Ugh. else, that would be a debugging nightmare, trying to figure out, okay, well, why is this not working? Well, because you just changed that byte. I offset it by one phone as supposed to, so instead of changing a data value, I've accidentally changed the actual you know, command on the 6809 I'm trying to execute. Right. Yeah. There's all kinds of issues you can get there. So it, it, it's a tool in the toolbox, but it should be used when you need it, and not just because I can do it. it yeah, it's, use, it's basically... It very carefully. It is a rusty wrench. How you don't want to grab wrench. it unless you <laughs> want deadness. All right. It's not, it's, Steve, it's not a rescue wrench. It's not a rescue wrench. It depends where you're going. No, if I didn't want, say rescue. Okay. I said rusty. it's a rusted wrench. Okay, okay. I, I, I thought you said rescue. Uh, no. Sorry. Yeah, it fits in its right. one spot, right? <laughs> right. All right. Well, let's 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 pause for just a second because we've we've been beating this horse for a little bit. I want to get back to um, some of the people in the live chat who I have not been able to acknowledge just yet. To some of the people watching the show, right? So just getting back to early. So so when Jim Brain from Retro Innovations came in, um, <laughs> one of his questions was, he goes. Is uh, is Grant still a newbie? I think there is a statute limitation <laughs> on newbies. I mean, he's asked enough newbie questions. Hopefully, something's sunk in by now, right, Grant? <laughs> true, that's true. <laughs> and then Curtis says, "I wonder if there's a statute limitations on trolls." And Mark oh. says, "Trolls are forever." Jim says, "Trolls get better with age." I'm at awesome and moving steadily towards perfect. It's important not to not to over design a game up front too. I guess that was chiming in when we were talking about the you know the process of coming up with a game, um, and then um, uh, number one finish uh, game finish killer. I guess is is feature creep, right? Uh, Mark mm -hmm. Overholzer says winner ship was what Jeeves, Steve Jobs quote was. Uh, Retro Innovation says games are easier to develop on the 6502. Um, I'm not sure. Uh, if that yeah, right. Yeah, right. And then, 
And then he was then uh, in, the ch in a cheering section here. What do I want to achieve? Game. When do I want to do it? Now. Um, Jim Gary says, my latest game, Ranger, is self-modifying in basic. It uses varpters in a uh, massive text array. Um, and getting back to the question, why is it bad? Solstice said, it's bad because it goes against the Von Neumann model, but I used to do it all the time back when I was uh, developing assembly apps for MS-DOS. At least, that's what the purists say. Um, what else do we have to say here? And uh, Retro Innovation says, stay on target. Yes, so there we go. So we're back on target. The original question was, uh, what is a process of developing a game? I think we've touched on that, and then we kind of got a little bit deeper into even more than um, the basic game development, but we definitely heard some assembly stuff, and that's not bad stuff to hear. Uh, so Grant, number one, Grant, are you still a newbie? Probably not. <laughs> <laughs> All okay, right, you're fired. So we need to find somebody yeah. else. Now, <laughs> now number two, uh, so getting back to your original question, what goes into the process? Um, have, you, have you heard enough? I think we're good. Pretty much it's like writing a paper or writing a book. It's your own style, What's mm -hmm. what you like yourself. Right. Yeah. And you learn as you go. You learn as you go. And it's a messy process. Yeah, it can be. <laughs> it can be. Yeah. All right. Stay so what organized. A notebook. We are going to take a commercial break. We are going to look at some of the things that have been going on in Facebook this week, and then we will be looking at what the latest news because there is some updates to Coco Fest that we will share with everyone too. So we'll be back in just a minute, folks. Stay on target, everyone. Hi, I'm Alan Huffman of Subbeat the Software. I won an award and I have a cool shirt. And you're watching the original gamer do old stuff. <laughs> Hey, have you got your Coco 3 yet? Hi, this is Rick Adams, author of Temple of Rom and Shanghai, and you've tuned into Coco Talk, the nation's leading live talk show featuring the Tandy Color Computer. What's going on everybody? Original Gamer Stevie Stroh here, and if you're a fan of vintage computing and retro gaming, then you're going to love our retro swag shop at 8bit256.com. There you will find custom designs by Instagram artist Joel M. Adams. You can get I'm a Coconut, Coco Talk, and other cool video game images on a t-shirt, coffee mug, or mouse pack. So if you love retro, then head on over to the retro swag shop at 8bit256.com today. Tell them the Original Gamer Stevie Stroh sent you. All right, and we're back, and we are here for news, the news segment. We should have some type of news little intro clip or something, right? So um, I haven't been watching the mailing list, so if anybody watched the mailing list, hopefully you, you got something to chime in on that. But we do know that Facebook is a great place to see what people are doing in the community too. So one of the posts here was Bruce Moore showing that he got Boise and Bill's book, Coco, The Colorful History of Tandy's Underdog Computer. If you are a fan of the color computer, this is required reading. He has the, um, the Kindle version. And the Kindle version is actually in full color, so all the pictures you'll see will be in color too. That's one benefit over the paper version, right? Uh, then we have some uh, nut job here named Simon Jonason uh, showing off. I guess this is what you were talking about earlier on your Cocoa, just trying to see what's going on with that power supply. Yeah, right? the Cocoa so, 3. Right? Here's a discussion we were talking about here with the ML Basic 2.0 compiler. So uh, James Ross posted this. So we definitely need to look into this, although this says Cocoa 3 with Disk Basic, huh? Um, but we'll take a look at that. ML Basic is a compiler for the color computer, I guess, where you could take uh, your basic program and, and have it run as assembly program. All right. Uh, we did see the Tandy 1000 holiday demo, which I'm not going to show because this is Coco Talk, not T Tandy Talk. All right. Uh, this was the uh, posting of the replay of last night's marathon, our four hour marathon of uh, playing Forest of Doom. Here's Simon showing some pictures of. His Coco 3 as he's unearthing it and trying to figure out what the hotel is going on here with this power supply. Lord knows what else. Ed Snyder chiming in now with a nice little schematic here. Talk about the community. Ask a question and you shall receive an answer, right? We've got a great community here of people sharing things. Here's a screenshot of Jason the Coco Man winning the game last night. The Duke of Doom and now right. we know that uh, Jason is the Duke. Paul is the Prince of Doom, right? So we've got a Duke and we've got a Prince. Yeah. 
Now, this is a cool project that's been going on for the past couple of weeks now. So, and this ties into last month's uh, Coco Crew podcast too, where we talked about the Infocom um, uh, game engine. So, Ed Snyder first he patched the Coco um, interpreter to run on the Coco VGA, which is the 64 column by 32 text mode and it's uh, lowercase included it's got a nice uh, non-scrollable status bar across the top and that looked really nice and then he also patched it to um, work on the Coco 3 in an 80 column display and then I believe we're saying now that he's even now uploaded um, a bunch of the games right so different games Cutthroat Islands Deadline, Enchanter, Plunder Hearts, Hollywood Hijinks, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, Leather Goddess of Phobos, uh, Mini Zork. I mean, the list goes on and on. Starcross, Zork 1, Zork 2, Zork 3. So we can now enjoy a lot of these Infocom games in 80 <laughs> columns, upper and lower case. And so if you're a fan of text adventures, you're a fan of what we're now calling interactive fiction, then this is a great way to go. And uh, is this for me? Is this from Australia? Oh, okay, cool. We got something from Brian Joyce that we're going to show off here too, right? So uh, Jason Reichard now showing off how he uh, found one of the innkeepers saying, I heard that uh, there's somebody wrote a book on how to survive Forest of Doom, right? Here's me posting my Coco that I got. Uh, here's the Coco VGA Infocom demo that we looked at last week. And Carlos Camacho is always up to something. Now he's breaking keyboards, it looks like. Brian Joyce showing a pretty cool um, uh, Christmas demo that he did here on the Color Computer 3. So it comes in. We got a nice little Christmas tree here. And then we're going to have, uh, here we go, Merry Christmas to all coconuts 2017. And we even have a nice little palette effect here. So that looks pretty cool, right? So things going on in the, in the Color Computer Facebook group. Have I missed anything of importance here? So Jason says I found a Y cable. What do you want to tell us about this Y cable, Jason? That's an old post, but I, I use that. Uh, that was an yeah. old one that I. That's how I use my uh, speech sound pack. Okay. Since I don't have a multi pack. Right. It's just something I had laying around. I, I did have to mess around with it to get it work, working, but. Cool stuff, cool stuff. Um, did, did, did Simon want to show his uh, current Coco 3 demo, what it's at right now? Or? Demo, demo, demo. Yeah, the new Coco 3 one you're working on, you had the videos of the VCC version, I think, running? Yeah, I can post it. Okay, here's Jason posting. Uh, this this was good, too. I enjoyed this. Yeah, you probably don't want to play that one. Copyright? We'll play probably, it for a few seconds. Yeah. <laughs> this, I, I, this never gets old. Looking at this screen and listening to music coming through the Coco, it never gets old. I want to do a video of this, too. When I tried recording this video, I didn't have a real Coco. I had no way to get music. Um, into the emulator that I knew of anyway so I am overdue on doing a um, my own version of this but yeah there's been a few versions of this so obviously um, uh, and we have the author with, with us here Steve Bjork <laughs> audio spectrum analyzer but yeah the the big scene for this was the the cool concert in Revenge of the Nerds where they're playing on a Coco 2 and you see this playing in the background it kind of immortalized and if you were into the Coco back then seeing this on the big screen was just like uh, it was like the holy grail moment um, and that song now, so somebody actually posted a video of them playing that Revenge of the Nerds song through the Audio Spectrum Analyzer too. So there's just been a lot of cool stuff. Uh, this was kind of funny here, talking about cassettes. So somebody's selling a uh, cassette tape for $200 on eBay, and that seems to be the buzzword. <laughs> Whenever somebody puts the word rare or vintage in front of something, they've become delusional and they think it's worth two to $300. <laughs> so if you're looking for a rare vintage $200 cassette tape, there's one waiting for you on eBay. Um, there's not even anything on it, it's a blank. Yeah, it's a blank yeah. one, right. Well, now, there's no leader either. Yeah, right. I this... just wonder how much metal oxide fall has fallen off of it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, really. Now, if you recall earlier, it was mentioned that uh, while a web browser on a Coco is not super practical, but a web server could be. So Boise Pete posted this picture here of running a web server on a Coco 3 through DriveWire and then pulling up a web page. So now he's pulled up on his Mac a web page that's being hosted on a Coco 3. That's kind of cool if you think about mm -hmm. it. All right? The things that we can do. 
So uh, this was me posting the, this was the first generation of this because the version of the editor Paul sent me did not have the ability to save. So once I drew everything, I had to write some code to plot everything out just to get them on screen because I wanted to visualize this. So this was my first version of, of doing this. Now it's a lot easier because I can just load it straight into um, video memory. This was a really weird thing here. I don't know what's going on in this thing, but the, it looks like it's got an issue. If these were teeth, this computer needed to see a dentist because look at this thing here. Um, I don't know what that was, but there's some weird contraption on here. Somebody was saying that this might have been used for typing tutors, and this was a clock to calculate how fast you were typing. We, we're not exactly sure what that cocoa was, but that's definitely an odd one. Uh, Carlos Camacho. Carlos has a has very interesting collection of, of machines. He seems to find them, and he actually travels. I think he went to Japan. And he actually got a lot of stuff from Japan. So he's got a lot of interesting 8-bit systems. And a lot of these share parts with the Coco. So like the uh, the same display chip and things like that. So it's yeah, They do share parts, but not very well. Ah, okay. <laughs> so uh, Jason showing his arrival of his Timberman package. Ron Delvaux, who's not with us today, um, but always doing something cool with the artwork, put together a Merry Christmas and Very Happy New Year to all from Ron's Garage. Here's Simon saying, hey, I got my Coco 3 out. This can't be good, right? <laughs> Simon's up to no good with his Coco 3. Um, Joel Harris got a Coco 1 in box in plastic. That's a beauty, eh? Uh, I, I just, there's, and that box in real, is in really good shape there, too. Look at that. Um, it's a serial number. low serial number for the F board. Yeah. So here's the thing. Yeah, 586, right? And look how clean it is. Look how clean. This is cleaner than that one that Carlos spray painted before. You know what I mean? This is a clean Coco one. Um, newer version because the badge is in the center, not offset to the left. There's no and no RAM, RAM marker, no RAM badge here. So it's a newer version Coco one, but still it's clean and pristine. That that'd be nice. That's that's like museum quality right there. If you look at that, it's got the operator's manual in there. Um, it's got the bag on it. That's nice. Those are cool. To, when you, if you can wow. get them, those are really cool. Um, of course, I posted um, a link to a page I created. I created a page called Start Here on uh, imacoconut.com. So it's just kind of like if you're new to the cocoa or you want to know where to begin, I kind of broke down some information um, for uh, any prospective cocoa nut. Um, Steve Batson had posted in here uh, an article on his um short review of the Coco on a Chip project, which spurred some controversy of calling it the Coco 4, apparently. And I love this picture here, Vincent Tran, <laughs> the Coco on a Chip. And here it is. Here's a Coco on a Chip. You can't have just one, right? So <laughs> That must be. No, you can have just one of those. That's a really big chip. <laughs> <laughs> I'd rather have it on a Dorito. Uh, another new member to the Facebook group, Chris Shilladay saying thanks for the ad. I'm a longtime collector. Uh, I have not owned a Coco in over 15 years, but he's got one now. So he's posted a picture of his little tandy corner here, and so it looks like he's got a Model 4P, 4P 4 like a Model 3. 4, a Model 3, another Model 3, and here's a Coco on some. Oh, there's an MC10 on top there. There's a doorstop. That that MC10 is actually holding this monitor <laughs> down so the wind doesn't blow it away. <laughs> <laughs> What kind of monitor is that? It's I don't like know. An Apple monitor or something. It's kind of neat. Um, so a lot of stuff going on. Here are some posts on this. So what I want to do? Um, uh, do you guys want to speak to some of these articles for a minute? Because I got something in the mail from Brian Joyce in Australia, and I need to get some scissors to open it. Um, anything in here that's worth discussing in a little bit more detail? If, if you can play Simon's current Coco Three demo just to show his little. Well, where is it? Eldritch. Did I pass it? On the. Um, on the on Discord, isn't it? Yeah. Is it a video? No, it's a, it's a, it's been image, and I just put it into a disk image for you, Steve, so you can run uh, it can, in can, the can, emulator. Can, is, uh, can somebody pull that up and screen share it real quick? Because I, I wanted to run and go grab some scissors real quick. How about, I'm going to do this. I'm going to run a commercial. You guys see if you can figure out who can who can show it, and I'll be back in like a minute and a half or less. I'll be back in about a minute. We'll be right back, folks. Hello, this is David Ladd, and you're watching Original Gamer Stevie Stroh. 
Radio Shack's store-wide manager's red tag sale is on now. We've slashed prices 20%, 30%, 40%, 50%. Save on famous Radio Shack Hi-Fi, car stereo, radios, toys, TV games, calculators, walkie-talkies, and CB radios. Look for the big red tag. Save like never before on these and literally hundreds of red tag specials. Hurry into Radio Shack today. Hi, this is John Linville and Neil Blanchard. We are the Coco Crew. I hope you're enjoying watching Stevie Stroh play video games, especially the Coco games. And when you're done with that, check out our podcast at CocoCrew.org. <laughs> At home, at the beach, in your car, at the shop, at the office, anywhere you enjoy fine audio programming. It's North America's premier source for color computer news, the Coco Crew Podcast. This is John Linville and Neil Blanchard, and we are the Coco Crew. I hope it's going to be a great show. Join John and Neil each month as they bring the latest news about the color computer, Dragon, MC10, and others. It's the Coco Crew Podcast. Visit www.cococrew.org and listen today. All right, hold on one second here. Let me unmute you guys. Oh, there it is. We have it. Hold on. Oh, no, I can't hear anything. All right, can you? Uh-oh. Hello, hello, hello. Can you guys hear me? Yes, yes. Yeah. All right. I don't know. My, my headphones are coming and going now. Anyways, I was trying to um, open this while we played a commercial to save time. But it turns out this freaking thing is wrapped. This is like a prank. And so I figured it's actually now gonna be more entertaining for you guys to sit here <laughs> and watch me try to open this bloody thing because I've, I've ripped, I've shredded, I've tried to find a place to cut with scissors. I don't know what's inside here, so I'm afraid to, to stab it too deep, which is what she said. And, um, and, and so this is from our, this is from our, friends, our friend Brian Joyce in Australia. And so, you know, friend of the show, part of the show, the package came in today while we're doing the show, so why not see what Brian has sent from Australia? Problem is, is opening this package is turning out to be quite the challenge. Um, and I'm just afraid to break the box or what's inside it because I literally don't know what's inside it and I'm hoping this is all appropriate for, you know, a family-friendly show at this point. <laughs> as I go to it's open. been sealed for your protection. Steve, we can't see it. You can't all see it. See is the demo Us on the panel right can't see it. Ah, uh, is my screen sharing not working right now? Share All we're seeing is a piece. graphics demo. Okay. Yeah, that's so on Skype. We can see it on the YouTube. Now, now we yeah. can see you. Now you can see me. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, well, this, there's so here's the box. I'm still trying to open the damn box. Um, <laughs> right, we're getting there. We are getting here. So Brian Joyce basically has pranked me by giving me an unopenable package here. I think we're getting here. Oh wow! Okay, we're getting here. We're getting here, people. In an unrelated note, there's a uh, tape shortage in Australia oh, now. Oh yeah, right. Okay, so this is cute. Okay, here's two koala bears hugging each other with an Australian flag, and they say, "Okay, this one here says Australia. I love Australia." On the back of the one here, it says, "I." So we've got these two koala bears hugging each other with Australian flags that say, I love Australia, and they're red and green. So that's kind of cute. Thank you for that, Brian. So that's one keepsake. Oh, my wife is going to love this. I told him that my wife collects shot glasses, and this is a shot glass from this. Hey, baby! Oh, nice. Baby! Come here! So I'll show her that when she comes in. All right, what else do we got in here? Ooh, oh, snap. Oh, my God. This is something that says OG Stevie on it, proudly made for you. <laughs> but is this Vegemite? Okay. Vegemite. We're, we're happy little Vegemites, yeah. I've got I've got a thing of Vegemite. What does this shit smell like? I don't know. We're going to open it up right now and find out. <laughs> You're not going to like it. No, it's unpleasant. <laughs> mm. 
I got you a shot glass from Australia. <laughs> oh, cool. Okay. My wife has her Australian shot glass now. And I got Vegemite, baby, with my name on it. What do you think of that? Um, if I knew what Vegemite was. You know the song oh. from Land Down Under? He gave me a bite of my Vegemite sandwich. It's something to eat in Australia. It's like oh, veg it's like okay. vegetable freaking peanut butter. It is, it's <laughs> a, a version of self-torture in Australia is what yeah. I call it. But, uh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Got, I got a couple more of these um, little koala bears hugging each other. That's kind of cute. So I have Vegemite with my name on it. How many people can say they have that? Uh, I don't know. Oh, another shot glass. Oh, two more shot glasses. Oh, damn. No. Another Australian shot glass. Look at that. Australia with the different uh, the nice. areas. Nice. All right. Good eye, Australia. Another Australian shot glass. All right. Another Australian shot glass. I love Oz. That's in Australia. I love Oz. That's cool. Very cool. I was wondering man. if that was about Ozzy Osbourne, but okay. Yeah. Oh, man. Another freaking <laughs> shot glass. Holy crap. <laughs> all right. Another shot glass. It's got the Australian map on it and uh, all kinds of little creatures. It's got a, it's got a dolphin and a uh, boomerang and a, and a uh, what do you call those things that jump up and down? The kangaroo. <laughs> right? Oh, my so. God. <laughs> Holy crap. And the shot glasses just won't stop. Here's another <laughs> shot glass. Look at this. <laughs> Australia. Like, oh, that's got like the outback in it, and it's got a dude with a uh, thingamajiggy, right? He's throwing a boomerang, and there's a koala bear out there, and a freaking uh, kangaroo, and it uh, looks like they're cooking David Ladd over the uh, fire there, if you can look at that real quick. So, um, yeah. Steve's very, an alcoholic. That class cool. is just full of stereotypes. <laughs> yeah, every, every, every Australian stereotype there is. And here's another one of all these different animals on the Australian map. I think they're animals, yeah. I Different think Australia's a dry country now because they sent you all their drinking in. Yeah, right? Yeah. So just a ton of shot glasses. And I got not one, not two, but three sets of these little <laughs> koala bears that say, I love Australia. So here you oh, go. Oh, you know, Oh, you can put them on every one of those shot glasses. Yeah, right? You can put them on the shot glasses and make them hug the shot glasses if you want. Very it's like cool. you've got a lot of drinking to do. Yeah, and yeah, so opening that up was like, I mean, it was just like, that thing was like taped and double taped and quadruple taped, and uh, <laughs> it was insane. Um, but yes, how many people can say they've got a jar of Vegemite with their name on it? I probably shouldn't have opened it because now it's going to go bad, right? It was sealed. I mean, it go bad. Can Vegemite go bad? Was it ever good? <laughs> it's pretty bad. That's the way Vegemite works. I'm, I'm actually going to try to taste it. I want to try to taste it. So, Isn't it so, made from like a byproduct of making beer? I oh, thought that's what I read. Yeah, um, pretty much. I have no freaking idea. Yeah, honestly. so brew beer and the sludge that collects on the bottom after you're done, you put that in a jar and that's called Vegemite. Ew. Mm. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty well describes the taste. Oh, that sounds lovely. <laughs> yes. All right. Well, I'm sorry about that, guys. I got distracted, but I thought that was kind of cool. Um, so now, getting back to Simon's demo. Somebody had that up on the screen before. I now have Skype school full screen. Anybody want to pull up Simon's demo again so we can see it? Yeah, I'm sharing it again right now. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Just look at uh, Jim's uh, post on the YouTube. <laughs> ah, look at this. I love that. you got the different colors scrolling up and down. You have a split screen scroll. You've got some superimposed uh, graphic in front of that. <laughs> Very cool stuff. That was this all written in basic, Simon? <laughs> <laughs> Self Self-modifying basic. <laughs> oh, at least you're running VCC 2.01. I mean, it's bad enough when you use VCC, but when you're using 1.42, it's just like, I don't know. It's, it's, it is what it is. <laughs> it's tested on, it on real real metal. Yeah, this would look better on, on real cocoa. But no, that's neat. Like Simon, it. you want to talk about anything behind it? Or you just want us to look at it? Uh, there's free pilot ridges being used. That's it. Yeah, it's using the same technique that Popstar used for the water and lightning. Okay. Yeah. You've got basically um, the left and the right hand side um, a bitmap, 320, 225. Left side is zeros, right side is one. The logo is two. 
pilot registers. Okay. Mm-hmm. So you're shifting the pilot register on a per, per scan line basis. Okay. Yeah. So, so on the left side, you're you're just reprogramming like colors or pallet register zero. You you make yeah. it like green on the first scan line, and then you make it dark green on the next scan line. Then make it white on the third scan line. You just keep changing the color as you go through. So there's actually no real animation. Basically, I have I have a lookup table of the rasters, the colors. Um, left side and right side are the same lookup table, just the different position. Um, so you're shifting, you're shifting um, palette which is a zero or one on a per scan line basis. And you're able to split the screen with doing this too, so you can you can change the palettes in the middle of the screen. Yeah, because half of the half of the bitmap is zeros and half of the bitmap is ones. Yeah, so it's color reg or palette register zero on the left and palette register one on the right. Yeah, and palette register two for the logo. Hmm. So are you the saying black. you you saying that the way you're adjusting the palette register is it's kind of an illusion that we're seeing these two different things, but you just colored yep. them that way to where it's uh, totally yes. it's totally it, funky. Yeah, the entire left side of the screen is color zero, and the entire right side of the screen is color one. Yeah, and they just, just changes, changes the, palette, the palette every scan line. Yeah, yeah, yeah. in the border. But how are you able to change right. the palette on two different sides of the screen? If they're two different. Because they're two different palette slots. Yeah, it's color uh, zero. Color okay. So he changes okay. color zero and yeah. one in the okay. border of the sink. I got gotcha. you. I got gotcha. you. It's fakey. It's really okay. fakey. Yeah, it's, it's the just, same technique Sockmaster used on his bouncing ball too. Yeah, yeah. It's just it's it, a, it, it's Hollywood. Yeah, no, yeah, that's cool looking. <laughs> I'm getting dizzy at this point. I'm about ready to have a seizure. But um, yeah, no, it's cool. <laughs> I don't know. Your outfit was already doing that for me. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh. You're number this, one, Curtis. This uh, is just the start, right, Simon? So. Yes, yes. Lots of lots of smoke and mirrors and lots of Hollywood. That's cool. That's cool. And somebody has to give Jim Brain a bit of a, a break on being a troll, so I just okay, jump I, in. Yeah, every once I'm not. Yeah, I'm not able to see what he's doing. All right, so we're going to switch back to the full screen Skype chat. So what is Jim doing here? All right, what am I missing on what am I missing on the chat right now? Let's see. All right, so we have missed what now? I'll stop sharing the screen so we can all see it too. Yeah, no, it's okay. Yeah, stop sharing the screen. Okay. We're back to... I'm just trying to read the, the chats right now. Stay on target. Okay. Then we have uh, Steve Bjork. Actually, games are so much better on the MC10 is what, <laughs> <laughs> what Jim Brain said. Uh, then Jim Gary says the 6502 <laughs> rules. Uh, and then he says, oops, I meant to say the 6803 is what rules. Um, <laughs> we were up to 19 watchers. Actually, now we're up to 20 watchers, so that's good. Uh, Jim says MC10 rules. And, oh, okay. And so Jim's asking, what does she use them for? Um, yeah. <laughs> so it says he can drive someone to drink, but this is a little bit too much. Yeah. Now, so my wife actually collects shot glasses. And um, she's got a, actually a custom uh, wooden case with glass and lights and stuff that my father-in-law built for her. So when 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 Brian mentioned that he was going to send me a, an Australian care package, I go, well, if there's any chance if you can find a shot glass, a shot glass, uh, my <laughs> wife my, my wife collects them. Apparently he found all the shot glasses Australia had. So <laughs> they're now dry county. But. Yeah. So. Um, so yeah, that's that's cool. That's a you know gift for me, and that became a gift for my wife. You know, happy wife, happy life. So there you go. <laughs> Looks uh, like you got them at the airport because they have all those stereotypes on them. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> all the. And I have to say, concerning the chat, the 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 notion that the uh, games are better in the MC10 is absolutely correct. That's because the floppy fits better on that smaller case when you lay them on top. So the games are on the MC10. <laughs> <laughs> Nice. Uh, I uh, I got some questions for for Mr. Bjork. Um, unless you guys have anything else that, that we was like uh, detrimental um, to talk about. No, well, we're going to talk about um, Coco Fest, but we can if if Mr. Bjork's up for a question, then we can certainly do that. Sure. 
Yeah, I, I just got a couple because um, you 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 programmed on a lot of different systems throughout your life. Um, what was your favorite to do? It's a cross between the Coco and the Sega Genesis. Ooh, neat! Two of my favorite. Another systems. Motorola based one. Yeah, sixty-eight thousand. And they're both Motorola processors and and like that. Um, it just, uh, as I said, the sixty oh nine was always a dream, and sixty eight thousand. You had the power on the Sega Genesis. What it would have been really great is if you took some of the graphic capability and definitely the sound capability of the Nintendo stuff for the Super Nintendo and put that into a Sega Genesis. That would have been a killer system. Mm -hmm. Cool. Yeah. And then. There's more to ask on that, but I'll do that later. Um, my second one was, what do you do now? Oh, you, boy. Yeah. <laughs> Jack of many trades, master or none. Uh, <laughs> I do web design, sound engineering. Um, I design circuit boards for companies. I also have a business where I design circuit boards for people to put together themselves for the haunt industry, the Halloween industry. Um, occasionally, I'll do some um, television and movie production. Cool. Um, I'm out here in California, so, I mean, in the past, I've done things like... Um, Build sets at studios. Um, and they're oh, it's just it's it, it's a whole sl slosh of stuff that I've done. As wow. I said, you know, jack of many trades, master of none. Cool. Thank you. Thanks for that. What? Even at one time, even at one time, I was a magician. <laughs> <laughs> just, just like Stevie was a stand-up stand comic. Yeah. 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 You pulled, off some, Jack, Nevada. Yeah. You, you pulled off some magic on the cocoa, for sure. Um, what I would say, Paul, is if you want to try to remember those questions and re-email them yeah. or send them to us in the chat or something, because we are going to have uh, probably a multifaceted interview with Steve Bjork on the, the pre coco years, the cocoa years, and the post coco years. So we are going to be enlisting a lot of questions that we can address in that interview. Um, oh, awesome. I got handfuls. Yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> Anyways, I'm gonna I'm gonna take off, guys. It's been great talking. All right, hey have Paul, good, thank you, thank day. you for being here. Thank you for your little sprite editor for me. Thank you for Timberman. Uh, how can people get a copy of Timberman if they still want to get one? You wanna you wanna plug that? Your was your email address? Oh sure, yeah, it's just my email address right now because I don't know how to make websites or anything. So, um, just Paul G there at Gmail .com. You email me. I tell you what to do, and then I usually send you a link to a server that is you can download the game from there, and while it's while I ship it, so you can play it before it gets there. Paul so. G as in George dot Thayer T H A Y E R at gmail dot yeah. com, right? right yeah, so G as in Gary, but Gary. you know that's cool. Yeah. G as in Gary. <laughs> so Paul Gary Thayer. Paul dot yes. G as in Gary dot Thayer T H A Y E R at gmizzle dot com. Hey, Paul, you know, we've talked about you working on maybe some options for that Sprite editor. Yes. Maybe I can work on some options to get you a website. <laughs> That'd be sweet, man. That'd be really cool. Thank <laughs> you. I got lots of servers, servers to put them on. <laughs> awesome. Cool. We'll talk later, uh, okay. Steve right. and everybody right. else. Thank you, guys. Merry Christmas. Happy New Year. You too. Yes, Merry Christmas to you, too. Thanks for being here, Paul. Merry Good Christmas, Paul. Good day. Hi, Paul. Ron Delvo just joined the live chat saying he's at the grocery store with my honey. Hey, Ron Delvo, Merry Christmas to you. You can do a segment of Ron's Garage from the uh, grocery store. Just put on your uh, <laughs> webcam. And just pan around and show us what's on sale this week. <laughs> uh, Richard Lorbieski, how are you? Doing good. Merry Christmas. Welcome to the program. Uh, thank you. Merry Christmas to you. All right. Uh, have you been watching? Are you familiar with what we've already discussed at this point, or would you like to ask us what the topic is? Oh, uh, you know, I'm just going to lurk. Uh, I, I just got in. <laughs> <laughs> I was I was at work, and I just got in, so um, 
I'm just I'm just crashing right now. All right, crashing the party. That's great. We're we're glad to have you. All right. Well, how about we do this? We are going to uh, run a commercial, and then we're going to come back, and we're going to talk about some news on the Glenside website and Cocoa Fest and the latest Glenside newsletter. Sound good? Sounds good. All right. We'll be back. Hey, I'm John Strong, author of Bomb Squad, and you're watching the original <laughs> Gamer CV Stro. Hey everybody, this is Bill Noble, co-author of Nitrous Nine. You are listening to Coco Talk Live, the leading live Coco Talk show. Good day, mates. This is Nick Marionettes, author of such color computer titles as Donut Disaster, Rupert Rhymes, and Rockstar Pilot. And I am here today to tell you about the world's most fabulous operating system, OS9. OS9 and its current incarnation Nitrous 9 is the most advanced operating system ever created. And what makes it so good? Ease of use. I find OS9 so incredibly intuitive that I haven't once cracked open the user manual. And yet I've been able to create such incredible games faster than the time it takes to sing Walsing Matilda. Using OS 9, I expect my next game, Funstar, will be done this weekend and distributed exclusively on ROM cartridge. OS 9 forever. Any resemblance to actual events to persons living or dead is purely coincidental. Nothing like ease of use, right? <laughs> uh, were we just joined by... Mm-hmm. We just joined by Jim Brain of Retro Innovations. It's always better to have you troll us in person. I don't have to read it. <laughs> <Yep>. Live trolling. <laughs> Merry Christmas, Jim. Welcome to the program. Did we lose Jim? I think we lost Jim we already. Lost Jim. All right. Well, so much. He's always that. been lost anyway. So. Live trolling, <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right. So yeah, he, he trolled just, you that he's coming onto the show. I think there is what you happened. Go. Right? That's that just <laughs> happened. All right. So why did why does Coco Talk exist? Coco Talk exists because it was a spontaneous decision to get together and talk about our excitement for Coco Fest. And since we are literally a day away from Christmas Eve, um, and everybody's familiar with the Christmas spirit. Uh, for those of us who are coconuts, getting close to Cocoa Talk is a very similar feeling to that Christmas Eve, that spirit of excitement as we get ready for what was our only annual uh, retreat. Now we have two with Tandy Assembly. So we started this um, for Cocoa Fest this year, which was it's always in April. And, and we've continued to have Cocoa Talk, uh, ironically. And, and we're coming up on next year's um, Cocoa Fest the website to the Glenside Color Computer Club is glensideccc.com. And this year is actually going to be the 27th annual Last Chicago Cocoa Fest. The dates are, um, where are the dates? I'm looking at the stuff and I can't see it right now. April 21st and April 22nd of 2018. The week after tax time. Ah, yes. So here's the dates of next week at the Heron Point Inn. Um, you can call and reserve. Now, this is what I didn't realize the first time I went. When you want to book a room, you don't have to pay for the room. So I didn't book my room until I knew I had the money in the bank, but then they are like, oh, no, you don't have to pay. And so if you think you're going to go, just book your room. And if, you, if it turns out you can't go, you can always cancel your reservations. Um, but you want to book the room and, and make sure you've got a room reserved and all that kind of stuff. So here's the website. What has been updated right now is we do know a handful of people who are going to be attended already. So here's the, here's the club. Here's the list. Do you Are you on it? But Rick Adams will be attending Neil Blanchard, Ron Delvaux, Ron Klein, Grant Leedy, John Linville, Mark Marlett, John Mark Mobley, uh, Boise Pete, Mike Rowan, John Strong, myself, and Evan Wright are already confirmed for being here. Um, do we have vendors? We do have some vendors listed. So the Glen Clyde, Glenside Club will be here. Boise is going to be here hosting a trivia contest. Brian Shubing, uh, always, um, Shubring, always um, bringing the music. Cloud Nine is always here, always a staple. John Mark Mobley will be here. Uh, John W. Linville, Mike Rowan, Neil Blanchard. Uh, I, I do want to have a table myself as well. 
um, and we do have some events listed. So we now know that if you arrive really early Friday, now Cocoa Fest is a Saturday and Sunday event, but if you arrive early Friday, we can set up as early as 6 p.m. So you could theoretically be completely set up Friday night and not have to worry about anything Saturday morning other than free breakfast and free coffee, right? So um, we can start up at 6 p.m. Vendors will be able to start to set up at 7.30. You got an hour and a half to set up your exhibit. Um, Saturday events, we also have a 7 a.m. setup. The show will open at 9 with music and the national anthems. This we talked about. We talked about this on the um, on the live stream we had with the Coco crew last last weekend. But a booth tour is going to be part of the show, and so um, we're going to do that. So the booth tour is going to start at 9:30. Everybody can come across and uh, look at everybody's exhibit because that seems to be something that gets missed out on. Then we're going to have lightning talks, which we also talked about on that discussion we had where. Um, there is no exhibitor or scheduled speaker, but if you want to share your ongoing Cocoa projects or passion, you have a chance to talk about it for a couple of minutes. Jim O'Keefe is going to talk about programming in fourth. We're going to have lunch. John Strong is going to give us an update on his video game development. I have asked for a slot for a Cocoa Talk Live, so we've got um, 45 minutes to do a live <coughs> Cocoa Talk from uh, Cocoa Fest, so that would be kind of cool. I want to get a lot of people in the room talking about that. We're gonna have an award ceremony, the minimum no bid auction, which is the you know this is like penny stock version of eBay. You can get really cool cocoa stuff for do I hear a dollar? Do I hear a dollar? Right? Um, On-site dinner. This is always a great treat. They bring a barbecue. We all get to sit down and eat lunch and dinner with each other. The trivia contest was a lot of fun. It's kind of like Cocoa Jeopardy. That's kind of fun. Then we're gonna basically have chit chat and hang out and possibly a musical jam if we can get everybody together. We get the band back together. So that's kind of cool. Uh, Sunday we open at 9. Um, there's a 9.30 speaker slot open. There's another speaker slot open. Um, there's a working lunch at 11.30. Uh, the final auction will be at 1 and then the um, show closes at 3. And we have to be cleaned up and out of there by like 5 p.m. Don't forget while you're here to touch the heron. That is a um, that is an important thing. So this is our working um, show format right now. How's it looking guys? That's I'll be looking going. good. Of course, um, I have intended one of these things a long time. But that may change this year. All right. Well, that would be great. <laughs> that would be a great surprise. Very cool. So we got that going on. So if you want to yeah. keep, keep in touch with that, you know where to go. Yeah, I've got the financial controller about to sign off on the budget. Ah, is that the wife? <laughs> yep. <laughs> Her brother lives in Chicago, so it's making it a little easier. There you go. Very, very cool. So the things are starting to shape up, and as as more things become available, um, we will we will share them with you. Um, to that same end, right now, um, what we also got this month was the Coco One Two Three newsletter, which is what Glenside puts out, I believe, quarterly, right? and uh, a lot of good stuff this month in the newsletter and so when we get into what's going on in the newsletter uh, of course uh, Tony Pedraza the president he has uh, an article that he puts in so we have from the president's plaza and he had an interesting story about what what is a computer and a computer is anything that aids a human being in, in doing calculations so he talked about how his father was in World War II and how they used certain um, like slide rule type computers to figure out where they were with navigations and things like that, so that was pretty neat. He's talking about the theme this year for um, Cocoa Fest, which is called Fusion. Fusion. Uh, the theme for Cocoa Fest and for 2018 is called Fusion. It's not the atomic kind, but the fusion of technologies like the 6809 and the 6309, and other operating systems like the Raspberry Pi, FPGA. How we add hardware onto the Cocoa. That's very cool stuff. Salvador Garcia did a really nice write-up of our Rainbow Online, um, which was very nice to see. I mean, this is a very long write-up here. It takes up pretty much a, a whole page. Um, John Mark Mobley uh, gave a, a shout-out to the imacoconut.com website, as well as the Tandy Forum website, tandyforum.org. Uh, John Mark Mobley talked a little bit about the bomb threat game. Um, then he gave a couple articles here on circuit tracers, how to set up a circuit tracer. 
And uh, then there's a, a kind of a photographic review of Tandy Assembly, which was pretty good. Showing off some of the booths here. And a great newsletter, I think. Great picture here of Scott Adams and Lance Miklas. And then um, getting into uh, some pictures of some, uh, here we have some retro, uh, we talked about retro innovations and Ian Maverick and Alan Hightower. Um, a lot of different, Richard Lorbieski was there for Voice and Tech. He's got some links to some of the videos. So kind of a nice breakdown of what happened at Tandy Assembly. And then now we've got a list of what's going on with Cocoa Fest right now. Um, put Cocoa Fest on your calendar. Visit Google Earth and explore the area. Make your reservations. Make your travel plans. If you plan to be an exhibitor or a vendor, contract, contact um, Tony Pedraza or John Mark. Um, may, they're, they're saying about a month before the show, they're hoping to have a pre-register and pre-pay. So uh, we'll have some updates to that on the website. Bring a camera. Bring hardware. Show up at 5 p.m. on Friday. Um, at 6.30, you can check in and... Um, you can start <coughs> setting up your tables. So this is just good stuff. So they're, it seems like they're a little, they're, uh, they're really um, on, on schedule or maybe, maybe even ahead of schedule on planning for this year, which is great. Um, here's a little article by Salvador, how to peek into your color computer 2 through the cartridge slot and figure out what version of board do you have. If you've got a D, E, or F board. Um, more links to things that were going on here. Go for retro products and CMOC compiler products, Retro Fanatic, which is, okay, so this is, this is a summary of things that have happened in the Coco mailing list and on Facebook that they put down. So it's great. So we have all these different resources. Salvador Garcia talking about the 6309 <laughs> piggyback project. Uh, actually really cool illustrations here. Salvador Garcia talking about retro Jetsonians. And so now how we are kind of living between the retro era and the Jetson era, which I thought was a pretty cool write up. Uh, a little talk about the Coco TV, which is Roger Taylor's project on Roku. Uh, John Mark Mobley showing off the Coco Christmas demo. And, um, and then another plug for Coco Fest. Here's the theme. It's called Coco Fusion. We've got so much new and old happening at once. I think that's a great theme to have. So yeah, a lot going on. And we are still four or five months away from uh, Coco Fest. But already a lot of plans happening. So cool stuff. What are you guys thinking about Coco Fest right now? Looking forward to it. Yes. Indeed. Indeed. David Ladd's excited. <laughs> what have I missed in the chat here? Anything good? Rondell Vo says, I'm going. That's right. Curtis Boyle says, we, we can't wait to see you there. Uh, Jim Brain says, the lightning talks are going to be interesting. He says, getting Coco fans to contain their talks to five minutes is like asking Steve <laughs> not to smile on Coco Talk. <laughs> Which Steve is he talking about right now, too? Or Jim not to troll, Chris <laughs> says, right? Yeah, all right. Uh, Jim says, I'm going to hire an auctioneer to do my lightning talk. <laughs> um, Jim Gary is asking, how does one order Forest of Doom? It's fod.gracenote.ca is the direct link to Bruce's site. But I also have a link to it on my retro swag shop at 8bit256.com. Um, good stuff. So, yeah, I, I think it's great that, you know, Coco Fest inspired this show. This show has been able to sustain a kind of a life of its own uh, in the post Coco Fest era. And, you know, originally I figured we might run out of steam or we might run out of things to talk about or maybe we would shorten our schedule to maybe twice a month or something. But we've managed to continue to babble on a weekly basis and it looks like there's no shortage of hot air to keep this sale full, uh, which is a great thing. Uh, sometimes you have a little bit less quality and a lot more quantity, but there's definitely no shortage of hot air. <laughs> Steve, you fill us in for that one. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, it's going to be great, and it'll be kind of cool to bring it all together and do an actual Coco Talk from Coco Fest. You know, bring it all together. Jim Brain says babbles right. So Jim Brain, he's here, but is he talking? I, right. <clears throat> I am. I'm here. All right. Finally. Lightning. Give us a lightning. Uh, a lightning talk. <laughs> I, I, I got to still hire my auctioneer. <laughs> Can you imagine that? Most of the people in the, I mean, if you think about the uh, the videos of the talks that were given like last year, it took people five minutes just to get started on the topic, right? It just started on the name of their, their thing. So it's going to be tough. 
It's going to be yeah. tough. It'll be interesting. Yeah, maybe we can start a tutorial series on YouTube on how to <laughs> be concise speaking. That's right. Concise <laughs> I don't speaking. think we should have Steve do that, though. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. That's, that's for true. That's true. And the crickets. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> That's ten seconds gone. Uh, I go. don't have what? my phone. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say if you if you want filler, I can always talk about floppies. Yes. <clears throat> <laughs> yeah, Ron's asking, did we chat on Boise's server? Well, we we mentioned Boise's server. We didn't actually chat on it though. Yeah, I think it's just a web server. I'm not sure that's an IRC server. Um, yeah, it's using it's using the DriveWire. Uh, yeah, no, yeah, but we talked about it. I was yeah. I was just being a little bit of a smartass. Yeah. Um, oh, just in case Ron missed that, I just wanted. Yeah, to throw yeah, it we did, we did mention it. We did go through that. We went through most of the stuff in Facebook, Ron, including um, showing your your uh, Christmas artwork that you produced for us. Um, cool stuff. What about uh the ease of use project? How's that coming along, Curtis? Uh, well, Christmas is kind of like slowing things down a bit. <laughs> um, I, I can say that Alan Huffman uh, got back to me because um, Nick had a request of uh, having an easy, easy file manager that didn't take a lot of resources because Multiview is a bit limited in file management. And um, he's given us permission to use Towel as soon as he finds the latest version. He's going to send me a copy and we'll be pre-installing that too. So it'll give you a way to do things. It's kind of similar in, in scope, I guess, to MShell by Bill Pierce, except it's a lot less resource because it's hardware text. It doesn't require graphics, and it's not quite as functional as all the stuff he's got thrown in, but it takes a lot less RAM than his, too. So basically, people will have a choice to use either one. Cool. I look forward to it. Hopefully, we'll get another uh, alpha version out uh, before the end of the year. Yeah, that's the that's the goal here. I think the six through nine one's kind of ready now. We're just working on the six eight zero nine one. Make sure we don't have any accidental six three zero nine only programs in there. So if you try to launch it, it crashes your machine. So it's kind of going through and cleaning things up. But with all the Christmas stuff going on right now, I haven't had much time to do much with it. Cool. I look forward to it. It'll be a lot of fun. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, yeah. And I can run it on real hardware now too, since I got my uh, S video adapter working again. Yep. Yeah. Good, good stuff. Well, we'd also talked about um, Coco Wishes, and I know we've talked about it a lot, a lot, but is there anything else anybody wanted to throw in? Like, what do I wish I had in my collection, or what do I wish uh, as far as a product for a Coco, or something you wish you had personally for your Coco that already exists? Anything we want to add to that, or you think we've... Uh... I, I wish Jim would troll more. <laughs> <laughs> It's my New Year's resolution. <laughs> you know, I wish we had a, a, a new host for Coco Talk. It's my New Year's disappeared. resolution. <laughs> <laughs> I'd, be, I'd be okay with just a dress code for the host to tell Coco Talk after today. But. <laughs> you know what the dress code is? Not being silhouetted in the video. Oh. Silhouetted. Okay, well, do they have dark light behind you? Yeah, well, they have light behind you, but no light in front of you. Right, right, right. right. Yeah, but the witness protection program, as we call it. Yeah, right. I, I keep seeing this too often, you know. Not just in your podcast, there was another podcast, and the host was in the witness protection program. And his opinion was, it looked just fine. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, the people that really that like MC tens should be in the witness protection. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I did Sorry, like Jim the Gary. doorstop photo. Yeah, that, that doorstop photo was great. <laughs> that was good. I hope for a Coco Four for next year. A <laughs> Coco Four. Oh no 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 no! <laughs> Look in the bear now. <laughs> I've got the website. Coco Four. Now, you've had it for quite a while. Yeah. Nobody's offered to buy it from me. <laughs> Steve, there you go. Shows the demand. <laughs> we'll see how those movies turn out. <laughs> yeah. Does anybody think we're actually going to see Daggerath in Ready Player One, the movie? I don't think we're going to. I'd like to, but... Right there. Well, there's so, <laughs> many, there's so many pop culture things already in the trailers like I just watched something where they showed like all the easter eggs where they paused and showed everything that was in every frame 
of the of the trailers out right now. So they're squeezing a lot of stuff in there. I, I don't think yeah. it's, it's just that Dagger was actually part of the plot. It, it, yes, part part of the More plot. More so than it, just a reference. It, so and yeah, it's it's hard to imagine why why you wouldn't. Um, other than maybe if they're so focused on all these big cultural icons that they're thinking it's not as big and people aren't going to automatically notice it by what it is. I don't know. I, I, you know. I don't know. I haven't read the book yet. I actually have the book, and maybe on my break I'll start reading it, um, or at least listening to it. Maybe I'll buy the audio version. But um, the audio version is excellent. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. it, I don't know. It's like it, it doesn't make sense. If if it's an integral part of the story, why would you rewrite that? You know, or take it out. I don't know. So I think I think uh, it's going to be one of those adapted from the book type movies. Um, and there, so far, everything I've seen in the trailers, there's very little content that I've actually seen in the trailers that was pulled from the book. I mean, one of the things that they're doing in the trailers, they're showing these race scenes, and there's no mention of any race scenes in the uh, book whatsoever. So I think it's going to be one of those. I, I hope I'm wrong. Yeah, about loosely this, based on almost. <laughs> yeah, mm -hmm. I, I hope I'm wrong on this because you know I've been looking forward to this for so long, and if they they don't have the reference to the Coco in there. I'm going to be greatly disappointed. Yeah. Jim well, uh, you got to also remember this is taking place a little bit in the future in a slightly different universe. That's correct. So could it be a universe where the Coco never existed? <laughs> and that's the reason why the universe is so bleak. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's the MC10 that's universe. That's what it is. Oh, oh God. <laughs> That's a horror film. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, the other thing too is, it's coming out in April, right? Uh, March. 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 That's even worse, because they don't think it's going to be able to compete with the other movies that are coming out in May and June. Oh, the yeah, summer blockbusters. Yeah, they had originally planned on a Christmas release, but because of Star Wars, Spielberg and the studio decided to release it in early spring. All right. Yeah. Plus, you give them enough time to put all the Daggereth references back in they might have missed. So, uh, my, my, <laughs> guess, my guess is if there's any Daggereth re reference at all, they're going to do it on something like an Apple or something um, where people are more familiar with the computer system. And if there's any mention, um, that's what we'll probably see. Well, it is a little bit in the future. It is VR uh, for the most part. So, yeah, I think it's like, let's take the story but move it ahead to about 20, 30 years from when it was written. We'll all know more in March. Yep. Yeah, they wanted yeah. to make it more easily accessible to today's generation, I think. The book was definitely written for our generation, though. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, we'll see. We can we can keep our fingers crossed. So that if that that's our Christmas wish. My Christmas wish is the Coco and Daggereth makes it to the movie. Yep, that's 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 why I brought it up because that was mine. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I hope I'm wrong, but I, I I'll be. Yeah, I'm, not, I'm not holding much hope. So right now for the Cocos, um, let's see what movie has the record for screen time of a Coco. I guess it is Revenge of the Nerds still. Revenge of the Nerds. Um, maybe a second place would be the original Friday the 13th where Corey Feldman's playing Zaxxon in the wrong color palette because the ground is red. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. um, but yeah, and I don't know that you actually see Corey and Zaxxon at the same time, but Zaxxon is on screen. And yeah. um, What movie actually, was this? The original Friday the 13th, the first one. Hmm. Yeah, there's several TV shows that it guested on too. Yeah, yeah it's, Silver Spoons I think has the record as far as screen time. Mm. Where uh, he's hacking him, into the yeah. yeah, him and Arnold are uh, hacking into the uh, federal computer system to get the latest plans for a uh, new top secret plane that the government's uh, building. Yeah, I mean it could have happened. <laughs> yes, I know. Did. I hacked into the CBC mainframe yeah. using my Coco. So yeah, if you could've. if you if you dialed the right phone number and had the right password, you just might have been able to pull up those plans. Huh? <laughs> Actually, Steve, that might be a good idea for a segment at some point in the future. Is uh, just going through all the different screenshots and uh, movie shots of uh, Coco's used throughout the yeah. years. And yeah, the yeah, yeah. Yeah, I keep hoping they're going to throw a Coco into Stranger Things, too, on Netflix. That'd be kind of cool. They that did have Radio be. Shack prominent. Yeah, they did have the Radio season. Shack, which was cool. Yeah. yeah. Of course, they killed the character off that was working there. but Yeah. 
Oh, sorry, spoiler, spoiler alert. Spoiler alert. Yeah, I haven't seen it yet. <laughs> they even put Radio Shack in a uh, Young Sheldon episode. Ah. You wanted to go to a Radio Shack. Some comment about it will always be here. Yeah, right? <laughs> <laughs> Jim Gary says if the Coco's not in Ready Player One, he's going to freak. Um, <laughs> Jim says I hacked into... MC Master University Master. and they had a they had a mini React store React store Reactor oh, thinking Oh yeah Jim, Jim says next you're gonna give away some last Jedi spoilers. Yeah. So we need to we need to cut back on the spoilers here in Coco Talk before it becomes spoiler talk, right? So <laughs> Nuclear Reactor. Okay, so you hacked into a a uh, an, an a mini nuclear reactor. Okay. You gotta be careful with those. It wasn't called Chernobyl, was it? <laughs> <laughs> All right, have we are we winding down to Coco Talk? Are you sure? Seems anything that anything way. Wanna beat? All right, so how about we do another commercial? We'll start to wrap things up, and uh, we'll get to some plugs and maybe some suggestions for next week. Next week will be the New Year's Eve Eve show, so um, perhaps some drinking will be uh, you know mandatory. Or at least preferred. <laughs> you have enough shot glasses now. You're ready um, to go. Yeah. So, so just so one more thing too. So we did have um, speaking of witness protection program, but I thought it was a good thing getting together. So I guess it was last Saturday, last weekend after Coco Talk, later in the evening, the, the Coco Crew podcast had their um, end of year roundtable discussion. Some of us were on that. That is going to end up on the Coco Crew podcast December episode which you know there's only a, you know a week left in December so hopefully we'll hear that soon uh, and I, I like the fact that they did that for those of you guys who were on it or maybe saw the replay what did you guys think of the talk I liked it it was, it was nice to first of all I finally got to join you and David and actually being a guest on their show albeit just for a, a mass a people version of it but uh, it was nice having the the year end summary and kind of going through you know how they progressed as a show over the year yeah so maybe we'll touch on that next week for our show as well okay didn't have enough jim trolling though yeah hey can you get this talking head to quit yammering and cut to the commercial jim says all right all right talking head is quitting com is quitting his yammering be right back Welcome to Ron the Garage. This is it. This is the place. This is where you should be. This is where you should tune in because Stevie Stroh has a great show. It's called Coco Talk. Hi, this is Randy Kindig of the Floppy Days Podcast. I just love me some cocoa, and nobody covers it better than Steve Strobridge. You're listening to Coco Talk. We're traveling through a dimension both of sound and ideas. We're at a place where the mind can comprehend and devise a solar radio, a wireless transmitter, measure time and light. 65 electronic projects brought to reality with this science fair kit. Astonishing, perhaps, but you can find it for Christmas for $17.95 in a place that's known as Radio Shack. Radio, stereos, recorders, everything in sound. Never get tired of seeing. <laughs> yeah. Never get tired of seeing Rod Serling do a Radio Shack commercial. All right, Jim saying, "Yay, commercial!" The best part of Coco Talk. All right. Oh yeah, and Ron Delvo, right? <laughs> ah, all right. What's what's Paul saying here? So we can, the things that we can't say with our mouth, we now have to say in text. Okay. <laughs> Nothing grinds my gears more worse than some chowderhead that doesn't know how to keep his big trap shut. All right. So, here we go. So, we are wrapping up Coco Talk episode 39. It has been great. It, yeah, we're, we're going downhill fast in the chat here. Yeah. So, um, it's been another good episode. And, uh, yeah, I want to wish everybody a Merry Christmas uh, if you've celebrated Hanukkah. I hope your Hanukkah was a good one. And uh, we got, uh, you know, the, the, the holiday spirit is with us. Winter time is here. It's all good times. I want to thank everybody who's been here who's still on the program right now. So Grant Leedy, David Ladd, Steve Bjork, Richard Lorbieski, Curtis Boyle, Jason Reichert, 
and uh, Paul Fiscarelli and even Jim Brain from Retro Innovations because without your trolls we would have nothing to talk about here. So thanks all of you for doing that. I want to also thank everybody in the live chat. We started off with Norlander and Solstice and Jim Gary who's still with us in the live chat. Thanks for being here Jim. You're welcome to join us on Skype at any given time Jim. Love to have you on here and um, Retro Innovations in the Skype chat, Norlander in the Skype chat, Richard Norbieski, Rondell Vo in the live chat making an appearance on Coco Talk, and even in bumper form we got Rondell Vo. So yeah, guys, thank you for all being here in the live chat as well. We uh, we're up to something like 20 live viewers. We're now in uh, kind of our our wrapping up. Um, anybody got anything they need to plug this week? I was just going to ask, how many podcasts do you have now, downloads? Oh, did I forget to do that? Yes. I, I probably did forget to do that. That <laughs> was one of the earlier things. That's a great question. And I'll have that answer for you here in just two seconds here, because I just got to pull it up where everybody else on the um, on the live screen can see it. So right now, we are at 3,700 and a half, right? Um, which is pretty good. We were at 3,600 last week, I think. So we are just right around the corner from 3,800 since last week. In the past three months, we've had 2,000 downloads. So not bad, not bad. What is the most listened to episode of all time now? That'd be a good thing to find out right now. So the Tandy Assembly pregame show with 138 downloads. Um, number two, uh, Nick Morentis' Pac-Man 1.1 update in the Basic 09 discussion. Episode 27, Ease of Use, coming in at number three. Uh, Tandy Assembly is in the list, uh, Hardware Innovations, uh, Retro Innovations and Hardware Talk is in the list, um, Community Chat is on the list, Podcast Announcement Episode 21 where we just announced that we were becoming a podcast, and Introduction to OS 9 comes in at number 9, Coco Talk After Dark rounding out the top 10 list with 103 views, so um, <laughs> not bad. So yeah, we, we get you know roughly 100 or some odd views. Uh, or listens per week, and then we usually get a, um, you know, a hundred or some odd downloads between 100 and 200 downloads. And so, you know, the question is, are we quote unquote competing with ourselves? And you know, I don't think it's you. You kind of can't compete with yourself, but are we comp Is is the audio competing with the video? And I think at the end of the day, if if it's if somebody's going to listen to it and they're going to enjoy it or get something out of it. However, it enters their brain is fine with me through the eyes, through the ears. You know, if you want to do an intravenously, you know, it's your call. Yeah, I don't um, view it as competition to yourself because yeah, people that are doing commutes and stuff they can't watch video while you're driving. I mean, so a lot of people do want the the audio version. I think that's why the numbers are as high as they are. Right, right, right. And so the because the audio is in the in the hundred some odd numbers that before we went audio, we always had two hundred views. Um, that was a pretty consistent number. Uh, now the views kind of fluctuate between 100, 150, 200, um, but we're getting 100 some odd or 100 to 100 plus downloads. So we're still doing 200 or better um, consumptions per week on this obscure little show. So uh, I'm, I'm happy with that. Yep, that's it's good to hear. Okay, so next week it will be our year end review. So maybe we'll do something similar to what. Um, Coco Crew did. Maybe we'll look at some of our episodes and, and watch the arc. Right? Was it an arc? Was it a, uh, you know, <laughs> is it a jagged graph? <coughs> is it a sawtooth pattern? Uh, <laughs> did, did, did you get much uh, emails with, uh, you know, best of things? Mm, the, only, no, the, the only one I got was uh, basically, which I think we can all agree with, but the whole segment of Steve Bjork with his uh, comments on what we can do with the MC-10. <laughs> Those are definitely kind of <laughs> I was hoping somebody maybe sent in the best Jim Brain troll from the year or something yeah, like that. So. Uh, it's hard to pick just one. That would be a whole show. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Jim says if you correlate trolling with high counts and there's a direct correlation so yeah um, does he even have a microphone uh -huh. <laughs> can you, you can speak you know you don't have to type oh I know but you guys are just you know it's better to put him on uh, it's better to put him in text <laughs> <laughs> it's his older MC10 thinking that's what's doing <laughs> it is no, no he wants visual record because if for some reason they can't hear him 
That's right. They can at least see video proof. That's right. <laughs> it's all about proof. Yeah. <laughs> Plausible you know, deniability. For, you know, for a while there, David was kind of becoming the whipping boy, and then I went off and did my thing on the MC-10. David's never been so happy because now it's the MC-10 <laughs> is the whipping boy. <laughs> I don't know if Jim Gary's happy about that, but... Uh... Yeah, we need to be careful. Poor, poor Jim. He likes the machine. He's a big fan. Yeah, he is, and he's. he's, he's <laughs> we're gonna put, we're gonna put you and and Jim, Steve, and we're gonna Steve Bork. We're gonna put you and Jim in a in a cage, a death match or something. <laughs> <laughs> hey, we just filled in the, one of the last slots at Coco Fest. That's right. That'll be the fifth slot. That'll be right at the end, and it'll be fun. We'll sell popcorn. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I can just see how that one's going to go. <laughs> I've got a hardware question. Yeah. Oh, God. Oh, boy. Now, you, in one corner, you got me being reasonable about the machines, and then you got him with his blinders on saying, this is the greatest thing ever cre created. <laughs> <laughs> and how do you argue with somebody that's nuts on a subject, you know? True, but you're going to have one Coco 3 to bat him with, and he's going to have all the MC-10s known to man in his corner because everybody gave one to him. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, they got tired of using him for door stops. That's right, so he'll just be chucking him at, <laughs> chucking him at you for 30 minutes. He'll wear you down. <laughs> Solstice he'll, he'll says, be... I gotta go. Thanks for being mm -hmm. here, Solstice. Solstice in the live chat. Gotta go. Fantastic talk. Best wishes for all. Have a great Christmas. You too, Solstice. Steve, I I know what the uh, MC tins would be related to. The rats that are in uh, the uh, forest of, of doom. To doom keep right? attacking you. <laughs> <laughs> The next You're being attacked by we'll 14 giant rats. <laughs> yeah, give, give them all three gold each to go you'll, away. You'll have both yeah. nine fanatics and MC10s both attacking you. The next Christmas version, of course. <laughs> oh. Oh, well, let man. me just say that was a lot. That was a lot of fun last night with that. I, that that's was. the most fun I've had with my Coco in a long time. Yeah, that's a great testimonial if you think about it. <clears throat> and, and and you know, getting back to Grant's question or just the, the topic of a game. And what makes a good game at the end of the day is the playability of it, you know. And, and I think some of the appeal of the older games, especially the 8-bit games, is that what they lacked in some of the technical sophistication they made up for in the creativity. Um, the, all the limitations of old hardware forced the creators to become creative and come up with these, these just gems. And I prefer to play, I'd, I'd play a game from the 80s any day. Um, not all the new games I'm that crazy about. So um, no, a lot of them are just retreads with different graphics. It's, it's yeah, the same gameplay but, over uh, and over and over again. Um, Forest of Doom it, it ties into some very primal things like your survival instinct. Um, you know, kind of I want to survive. I want to you know I want to get to the castle, I, and then now you know and I want to get home alive. And then occasionally greed fic factors in. So all of these kind of very primal. Um, uh, emotions and feelings um, it definitely taps into without fancy graphics you know it's it's 90 percent text well you know it's like what Sheldon Cooper said on Big Bang Theory these text adventures they run on the greatest graphics chip your imagination yeah yeah and it's so true and it's so true uh, so next week we'll try to do a year-end review. Any other suggestions for next week's show? Have it not suck, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> well, now you're just reaching for the stars. Right? <laughs> I know you are. That's never going to happen. <laughs> new set host. expectations low. Yes. And yeah. no one's disappointed. We do have a vote for a new host. I nominate Grant Leedy. So, oh God, uh, <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> only okay. if he. Only if every one of his shots has the. Has the, the fan on him? The propeller. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, yeah, beat, the yeah. propeller. The beat, yeah, we, yeah. <laughs> the propeller made the show. In the show, that's what yeah. we're missing right now. Is we're not missing cowbell. We're missing propeller. Propeller. So. Need more propeller. <laughs> yes, uh, and you didn't bring this up, Steve. What about um, our uh, almost nightly chats that we have in our little uh, new social group that you put together? 
Yeah, our Discord, Discord server. Um, we should probably plug Discord. So for those of you, uh, well, we plug it, but we got to plug it again, right? That's the thing about advertising. Does McDonald's need to advertise? Well, technically, they don't need to advertise because they always advertise, right? So let's find that. I'll post the link. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. I do uh, think, though, that you guys should put some sort of disclaimer because um, so those nightly chats, while they are entirely enlightening, they are a major drain on productivity. Yes, that's why I haven't been participating in those. Major. Well, no, no, no. They they do help. After all, somebody was having a problem getting their values to show up on components in um, EagleCat, and I was able to help that person. All right, well, then then kudos for you, because every time I get in there, it's just like, oh, here goes the night. I'm not going to get anything accomplished. Right. It becomes a troll fest. I have no idea why. <laughs> oh, I don't know either. That is I, truly, that's truly unknown. How did that happen? And we don't know. I, I don't know. It's like, well, let's see here. Productivity, I think it was, what, Richard? Was that the, uh, I think we had productivity in, in there, Richard, didn't we? And then Steve, we had productivity. So, yeah, yeah. I think there's productivity. Going yeah, we, we, we solved world world hunger and, and peace throughout the, throughout the universe. <laughs> Fake on news. the on the days I wasn't there, right, so yeah, exactly. Are you, trying, are you trying to tell me something? <laughs> I think I'm holding my hand at something. No, there was that one time I, I had that had that problem with the joystick, and you just whipped out a schematic in an hour. I was just like, wow, you know. That's true. It would have been faster if you guys had kit had kit uh, uh, asking me, "Hey Jim, what are you doing? Hey Jim, yeah, Jim. what are you doing now? What are you doing?" <laughs> it's like it's like the adult equivalent of, "Are we there yet? Are we there yet?" Right, there. right, right. Yes, but it's more entertaining to see what you do. Well, true, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> see, this is what you have to enjoy when there you join you the the voice chats on um, Discord. Discord. Yeah, and I posted the link to Discord. It's not a permanent link. It's a short-term link. So if you want to join the Discord uh, chat server, click on that link, install Discord, or you can run it in a browser. You don't have to install it. Uh, it runs on Windows, Mac, Linux, browser, runs on Android, iOS, uh, and it probably even run on a BlackBerry. Who knows? So, um, yeah, Discord and is MC10 a lot of fun. too. Don't forget. I, I, the other thing with the Discord chats too is uh, they're far more candid and uh, non censored. So, the uh, enjoyment factor goes up an uh, order of magnitude there. <laughs> right, right. Well, the other disclaimer that we should say too is that when we're, when we're on Discord, what happens in Discord stays in Discord, so it's not necessarily for the air. It's not necessarily for repeating or sharing. Um, you know, there were some like trade secrets going on when a bomb threat was being developed when we were still in the Skype group. You know, a lot of assembly code was being swapped and things like that. So, um, you know, just because we're talking about things doesn't mean uh, you know. Let's go ahead and record this and put it on YouTube. So, a lot of these discussions are. Oh are really? Definitely. Oh, <laughs> I do that all the time. I was say, yeah, you know, <laughs> channel just. So yeah, so unless it's you know, but yeah, so th this know that too. If somebody new coming into this, it's not like oh wow, I'm going to start my own Coco Talk show with these discussions because it's. Uh, <laughs> um. All right, guys, we're going to wrap up Coco Talk episode 39. Any closing holiday thoughts here for the people at home? Yep. Just a merry, merry Christmas, Christmas to everybody. And a happy merry New Christmas. Year. Yeah, happy holidays, everyone. I'm going to save the Happy New Year until our next show, since that's before New Year's. So. Roger that. All right. Well, we're going to cue outro music now. And so we'll see you guys next week. Bye-bye, everybody. Thank you for watching Coco Talk, the world's leading live talk show featuring the Sandy Feller computer. For all things Coco Talk, visit us on the web at cocotalk.live. We'd love to hear from you. Send feedback, suggestions, even segments via email to cocotalk at cocotalk.live. If you love the color computer like we do, then visit imacoconut.com for all your color computer needs. Consider supporting the show with a purchase of merchandise from our retro swag shop at 8bit256.com. If you'd like to become a patron of the show, we'd love for you to visit our Patreon site at patreon.com slash Coco Talk would not exist without the community, its cast, and crew. Thanks go to Curtis Boyle, David Ladd, Mark Overholzer, Grant Leedy, Bruce Moore, Rick Adams, Ron Delvaux, Richard Lorbieski, 
Jim Brain, Nick Marentis, Karen Anscombe, Simon Jonason, Wayne Campbell, Steve Batson, John Strong, and Barry Nelson. Special thanks to Steve Bjork for production suggestions. Stay on target, everyone. Please help support the Color Computer community by visiting some of its contributors. The Coco Crew Podcast at CocoCrew.org. Glenside Color Computer Club, host of Coco Fest at GlensideCCC.com. Jim Brain and Retro Innovations at Go, the number four, Retro.com. Tandy Assembly at TandyAssembly.com. Cloud9 Technologies at Cloud, the number nine, Tech.com. Voice and Technologies at BOYSON.com. Richard just mentioned I have the wrong link to his website. So why don't you give us your website, Boyson Tech. Oh, so it's not Boyson.com. It's BoysonTech.com. Right. It's, yeah, www. Well, you can do www, but it's BoysonTech.com or even Boyson.tech. I got both of them, so. BoysonTech.com. All right, so I'm going to have to update that. Thanks. <laughs> All right. Well, we are now officially off the air.